There is something wrong with Anastasia State Park by Saraya G. I was feeling adventurous and decided to explore the Anastasia State Park independently. I had heard it was beautiful with stunning ocean views and dense forests. The day was perfect for an outdoor adventurer like myself with the sun shining and a gentle breeze blowing. However, as I began my journey, I noticed how quiet it really was around me. The only sounds I could hear were the rustling of leaves under my feet and the occasional bird making some sort of chirping sound. I walked for a couple of hours, taking in the breathtaking scenery around me. But as the sun started to set, I realized I had lost track of time and honestly had no idea where I had ended up. I tried to retrace my steps as best as I could, but every direction I turned seemingly looked the same. I started to feel anxious and got a bit scared. The forest had become dark and the silence had been peaceful earlier, but now it almost seemed deafening. The rustling of leaves now sounded like footsteps behind me. I tried my best to stay calm. I tried to call out for help, but my voice echoed through the trees without any response. Then, the forest darkness started to play tricks on my mind, and I could swear I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. My heart was racing and I started to run, hoping to find my way back to civilization. But as I ran, the forest only seemed to get darker and more ominous. I could hear strange noises and whispers, but couldn't quite make out what they were saying. I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin after some time, and my relief was only short-lived as I noticed the door was slightly ajar. As I pushed the door open, the smell of decay filled my nostrils. I could see that the cabin had not been inhabited for quite some years, but I noticed fresh blood on the walls. I knew I had to leave and I had to get out of there fast. I ran out of that cabin and into the darkness of the forest once more. I could hear the footsteps behind me again and I knew that I was being pursued. I tripped and fell and as I looked up I saw the shadowy figure looming over me. The last thing I remember was the sound of my screams echoing through the forest as I was dragged away into the darkness. I woke up like quite some hours later, I couldn't tell you how long it was, disoriented and completely confused in the woods and with no memory of how I got there or what happened. To this day, I have never returned to Anastasia State Park, and I don't think I ever will. It took me quite a few hours to finally figure out where I was during the daytime hours, and luckily, I was able to follow a trail of smoke from a local campfire, so eventually I did find help. I will never, ever return to that area though. The memory, it still haunts me at night, and I've learned to never underestimate the dangers of exploring unknown territories alone, but I really don't know what happened to me that night. What, whatever that shadow was, uh, I don't know. Do Not Primitive Camp in This State Park by Bagged Carpet 1313 I have always loved the great outdoors, so when I heard about the Amicalola Falls State Park, I knew I had to go. I packed my backpack with all the necessary camping gear and set off on my adventure. The park was vast and absolutely beautiful, with brushes of lush greenery and towering trees that seemed to touch the sky. As I hiked more profoundly into the park, I felt a sense of calm and tranquility come over me. The only sounds I could really hear were the rustling of leaves, birds chirping, and my own heartbeat. I genuinely felt at peace with nature and forgot all about my worries momentarily. Then, the sunset began to go down and I realized I still needed to set up camp. So I found a spot near a small creek, pitched my tent, and created a little fire. I sat by the fire enjoying the warmth and cooked myself a small dinner of canned soup. As the night time fell and the woods around me became darker and more ominous, the silence that had been peaceful earlier now seemed to be almost deafening and overpowering. The wind started to pick up and the trees began to creak as if they were whispering secrets to each other. It was honestly some of the creepiest things I've ever heard and I spent a lot of times out in the woods. I tried my absolute best to ignore the strange sense of unease creeping up on me. I settled into my tent and I began to read a book for some time, trying to calm my nerves in any way as I could, 
but as the hours passed, I realized that I couldn't shake off that feeling that I was being watched by something or someone. I heard strange noises outside my tent, and my heart began to race. I began to hear footsteps approaching me, and I suddenly knew I wasn't alone. Now, I wouldn't have been that concerned if it were, you know, multiple footsteps at a time, like a bear or an elk or whatever else might be out here, you know? But the fact of the matter is these were bipedal, and they sounded very deliberate, like they knew exactly where I was and they were coming straight toward me. I, I honestly tried to stay calm and reasoned with myself that it could have just been an animal or just another hiker. But the fear was overwhelming, and it was dark by this point. I peeked through the opening of my tent, and a shadowy, tall figure was lurking in the darkness, hunched over. I couldn't determine who or what it was, but I knew it wasn't human after some time. The figure seemed to be getting closer and closer very slowly, and I felt like I was being trapped. I tried my best to scream out, but it was almost like my voice got caught in my throat. This figure lunged towards me, and, and I suddenly blacked out. But again, when I woke up, it was morning and the sun was shining brightly. I couldn't remember what had even happened the night before, and I felt like I had a massive migraine. But I knew something wasn't right. As I started packing my tent, I had noticed my gear had been ransacked. Some items were missing, but I needed help remembering what they were. I hiked back to civilization, feeling shaken and scared, and I just couldn't shake off that something massively terrible happened. Obviously, after some time, I began slowly remembering everything that went on and that creature. But why didn't it kill me? Why, why did I just black out? And why did it seemingly just steal things from me? The ranger that I eventually walked up to and told about this was very skeptical and brushed it off as a bear attack, but I knew it was much more sinister. To this day, I still can't really fully explain what happened to me that night. I don't even know if it was a wild animal or something supernatural. But one thing is for sure, I'll never go back to Amicalola Falls State Park ever again, and you're damn sure I will always go camping with a freaking firearm. Goatman Spared My Life by Anonymous I honestly used to love to go jogging in my local state park. It was a great way to get in exercise, enjoy nature, and clear my head all at once. But today took a tor- But one day, things took a very terrifying turn. I set off on my usual route, enjoying the peak's peacefulness. The sun was shining, and there was a light breeze in the air. It was a perfect day for a jog. I had gone about a mile in when I heard something rustling in the bushes. At first, I thought it was just an animal, but as I got closer, I saw a figure moving in the trees. It was tall with long, thin arms and legs covered in what looked like matted fur. It had a snout-like face with piercing red eyes that seemed to glow in the sunlight. I froze, not really knowing what to do. The creature started to move toward me and I could hear its hooves pounding on the ground. I let out a blood-curdling scream, and I knew I had to run like my life depended on it. I took off as fast as I could, but the creature was fast and was catching up to me. I could hear its ragged breathing and felt its hot breath on my neck at one point. I turned around to face it, but it was far too late. The creature had begun to tackle me to the ground. I tried to fight it off, but it was far too strong. Its long, sharp claws dug into my skin, and I could feel its hot breath on my face. I let out a scream of pain, and I knew I was probably going to die here. As I began to lay on the ground, helpless, the goat man creature towering over me, its razor-sharp claws inches from my face, its snout-like nose twitched as it sniffed me, its red eyes boring into mine. I could smell the stench of its breath, a mix of rotting meat and decaying vegetation. Its fur was matted and greasy, covered in dirt and leaves. I could feel the heat radiating from its body and the weight of it pressing down on me. I struggled to break free, but the Goatman creature was just far too strong. It uttered a piercing scream, and I knew it was over. Uh, I, I just resigned myself there, closed my eyes, and waited for the final blow. But, out of nowhere, something really strange happened. The Goatman creature suddenly stopped attacking me and just took off into the trees, vanishing right then and there. I honestly laid there for who knows how long, confused and absolutely terrified. 
Not knowing what to do, after a few moments, I managed to finally pull myself together, get to my feet, and started my best to run towards the entrance. My heart was pounding, my legs felt like lead, and I didn't stop until I was finally out of that dreaded park. Luckily, my wounds seemed to be more superficial than anything. When I got home, I, I was in shock. I couldn't believe what the heck had just happened to me. I spent the rest of the night pacing back and forth in my room, trying to make sense of it all. I, I didn't know if I should tell my parents who to tell, who would believe me. The next day, I went to the library to research goat-man-type creatures, and I discovered there were legendary creatures, half-human, half-goat, originating in Greek mythology. There were stories of goat-man animals throughout history with sightings worldwide, even in Texas, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, all over. But I knew what I had seen was real and was no mere myth. The goat man creature in the park had terrifyingly been real. I tried to warn the park authorities, but they thought I was just playing a prank. They told me it was probably a wild animal, some sort of dog or something, and I was lucky to have escaped. But I knew the truth. The goat man creature was still out there, waiting for his next victim. Maybe he wouldn't be so... sparing to the next. I never returned to that park again, and I warned everyone that I knew to stay away. The beast is still lurking in the shadows, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike again. I just know it. Why I Quit My Job as a Park Ranger by Turbo Baker 67 I've been a park ranger for over 15 years, and I've seen some pretty strange things in my time. But nothing could have prepared me for what I saw that night in the state park. It was late, and I was making my rounds, checking the various campsites and hiking trails. That's when I stumbled upon the remains of a dead bear. It looked like it had been mauled by something much bigger and more powerful. I took a few pictures to document the scene and send it to the higher-ups for investigation. The last thing we needed was a giant cannibal bear around. As I was about to leave the area, something caught my eye. A shadowy figure moving in the trees nearby just out of my line of sight. I figured it had to be some deer or something like that, so I approached slowly, trying not to startle it. But as I got closer, I realized this indeed was no deer. It was something much more grotesque. It had the body of a man but the face of a bear. Its eyes glowed a bright red, and its teeth were long and sharp. It was covered in thick, matted fur and smelled like death. I froze in terror as the creature began to growl and snarl. I knew I had to leave, but my legs just wouldn't carry me away. It was like they were rooted to that spot. That's when the creature charged at me. I tried to run, but it was far too fast. It tackled me to the ground, and I felt its hot breath on my face. I thought I was going to die right then and there... But, as fast as it had attacked me, it ran into the woods, leaving me shaken and scared. I don't know why. As I tried to collect myself and the radio for backup, I, I, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. Like this thing wasn't actually gone, you know? The feeling of being followed just never left me, even as I drove away from that state park. I tried to shake it off as just my nerves, but something about the encounter with that creature had left a deep mark on me. Over the next few days, I dug into the park's history to find any records of strange sightings or reports of animals acting oddly. That's when I stumbled upon an old newspaper article from the mid-1950s. It talked about a group of loggers who had gone missing in the woods never to be seen again. The article described how some loggers had reported seeing some strange creatures with a man's body and a bear's face in the woods before disappearing. I couldn't even believe what I was reading. Was it possible that the creature I had encountered was the same thing that had been reported all those years ago? Or maybe it was just one of its children or something? I knew I had to investigate further to figure this out. So I did return to that area where I had seen the creature, armed with a camera and a flashlight. I searched the woods for hours to find evidence of its existence. That's when I stumbled upon a cave. It was hidden behind a large boulder. I would have missed it if I hadn't paid more attention. I cautiously approached the cave, shining my flashlight inside. What I saw made my blood run cold. The cave was littered with bones, some of them clearly human. The air was thick with the stench of death, and I could hear something breathing deep within the darkness. I knew I had to get out of there before this thing would get me and not spare me like it did before. 
As I turned to leave, I swear I, I just had this feeling of being watched all over again. As I began to turn to leave, something grabbed my ankle. I fell to the ground and my flashlight flew out of my hand. I could feel something trying to pull me back into the cave, dragging me towards the darkness. I fought with all my strength, kicking and screaming, and eventually I was able to break free and run from the cave. The only thing I lost in that process was one of my hiking boots. I stumbled into the daylight, gasping for air. I never turned back, I never looked back, and I never even went back to that state park. I, I quit right then and there on the spot, and I left. And I forever will feel this deep dread. I, I was just lucky enough to make it out alive. Twice. To this day, I still wonder what that creature is. Whether it's still out there in the woods waiting for its next victim. And where it even came from. Hey Swamp, I hope this letter finds you well. It's your friend from Washington again. I can't thank you enough for reading my last letter. Seeing so many kind words of support and the request for an update mean more than you can imagine. It gave me the courage to finally tell my wife everything. And while it was a difficult conversation, the relief that came with it made me feel 20 years younger. I'm sorry I can't use real names. But where the internet is concerned, there's really no such thing as too careful. Hopefully, I can make it up to the swamp with some new information. The first thing you should know is Amy resigned. I miss her, but I'm glad she's not in danger anymore. Do you remember how worried I was at the end of my last letter? For those who don't know, she had recurring nightmares, where she was reliving her encounter with the creature. At first it was the same. But when the monster should have disappeared, it turned to face her. It even began walking towards her, getting a little closer each night until it was only a few feet away. The nightmare she had next was so bad, her wife told Rick to trash everything left in her locker because she was not coming for it. There wasn't much there, just some pictures and a few basics, but it felt wrong to throw them away. I drove to Amy's after work, expecting to leave her box by the door. But when I got out of the car, her wife was waving to me. Thanks for going through the trouble. Can you stay for some coffee? She asked, already leading me inside. The nightmare that finally made, Amy quit gives me chills to write. This time, she was face to face with the creature. Its mouth inches from her own, and it began whistling a sad, eerie tune she could not identify. The sound made her feel safe and calm, but after waking... She realized it was more like hypnosis. Is it an extension of the monster's abilities or the result of psychological trauma? Yes. She said the eyes looked the same as what we saw on camera. But I had previously described the eye I saw. It's easy for our minds to warp images into what we expect to see. I've spent an unhealthy amount of time fixated on this, and I'm fairly comfortable with my personal conclusion. Though... Please keep in mind this is purely my theory. The night she saw the creature standing over that little girl, her brain realized an important detail, and the nightmares were its way of relaying that information. Now that it has, it's finished. Those whistles seem to have a literal hypnotic effect. But if that's true, who knows if it can hold sway over our dreams. I admit, my judgment is biased. I hate thinking the creature could appear in my dreams, or that it could potentially regain control over my friends. We didn't have anyone to cover for Amy the first night, so Ranger Rick himself partnered with me for the shift. I don't think he's a bad guy. I was admittedly spiteful about the withheld information, but now that I understand more about what he does, it's hard to blame him. He's following orders, just like me. He needs a paycheck, just like me. The problems we have at night are also happening during the day. It's not like they're walking around in sunshine and daisies while we're fighting monsters in the dark. The guests are also much more active during their shift, which makes it much harder to keep track of people in their territory. Apparently this kind of stuff has been happening for as long as anyone remembers, but never so blatantly as what we've been experiencing recently. The last few months specifically are making Rick's mysterious bosses quite nervous, and frankly, the way he refers to them as management 
makes me quite nervous. Okay, maybe it doesn't sound as sinister when you read it, but it sounds something very men in blacky. Something with conspiratorial inflection, if you get what I mean. Normally, there are entire decades where literally nothing happens. Then, they'll have a cluster of disappearances and accidents for a few months. The cycle was always the same. Until now. This time it's not stopping, and no one knows what to do. Even Rick isn't sure if management knows what the creature actually is. But the rangers call it the Whistler. Fair enough, I suppose. Most of the stories he shared were the same, but none was more particularly chilling than the one that took place his rookie year in the 1990s when he was responding to reports of black bears near the lodges. Back then, there were only a few cabins on each side of the lake. When this incident took place, one was occupied by a family of five and a young couple was staying on the opposite bank. The order came at the end of a dark, drizzly day, and the real storm was due to start any minute. There hadn't been a Whistler sighting in eight years, and nothing about this report raised any flags when the senior rangers passed it off to Rick. He drove a golf cart to the lake and was greeted by the family waving from a window. They were afraid to come out for some reason. Rick joined them and listened with growing apprehension as the storm began in earnest. It started with a large black animal trying to open the metal trash cans. Mr. Gordon used his air horn to scare the beast away, but instead of fleeing it turned to face him, rising to its full height and glaring angrily. That's when he saw that it was no bear and yelled for his shotgun. In the process of explaining how the creature fled before he could shoot, Mr. Gordon's story was interrupted by frantic screaming outside. The young couple was racing toward them, waving their arms and begging for help. Once safely indoors, they walked through each room checking every window. When satisfied nothing had followed them, they were able to explain. They had been eating dinner when the patio door slid open. They looked over to see a hulking beast with bright red eyes. The couple escaped through the front door and ran straight for the park ranger's golf cart. Both the family and the couple wanted to leave. Rick too, for that matter. But the weather made it easier said than done. The storm knocked out the phone line, and there was no response on the radio. Even if everyone could somehow fit into the small cart, it would be incredibly dangerous to drive in this weather. The weather reports had only warned against heavy rain, but in a span of just a few minutes it developed into tree-bending gusts of wind, lightning streaked across the sky, cracks of thunder shook the walls, and there was a frightening threat of tornado activity as the temperature dropped drastically. Rick was out of his depth and terrified, but he couldn't show it. He had to be in charge. In the 90s, it wasn't a big deal if a ranger licensed to carry wanted to bring their handgun to work. Rick's 38 and Gordon's shotgun were the only real weapons the group had as they waited in the cabin's living room. They were trapped and had no clue where or what the creature was, but things weren't exactly hopeless. The doors and shutters were locked, and soon, help would be sent to investigate why Rick didn't come back after the bear sighting. At least, that's what he told the others, leaving out the part where they might assume he was simply unable due to the weather conditions. Regardless of rescue chances, they should be able to wait out the storm as long as nobody panicked. The larger a group is, the harder they are to control, especially for a single person in charge. Rick asked the children to check the phone lines every few minutes as a distraction. Quiet children make happy parents, but he knew it would be weeks until they were functional again. The five adults were whispering amongst themselves for only a few minutes before the girls called out, The phone is working! Rick, assuming they were either mistaken or joking, simply said to make sure no one else used it. The eight-year-old lifted the receiver once again, firmly stating, You can't be on this line. And everyone fell into a stunned silence as a deep, menacing voice replied. No one is sure what it said, and the girl wouldn't repeat it, but she dropped the phone screaming while it was still talking. Rick rushed to hang it up, hoping he could use it after all, but the line was dead. After that, the girls were given coloring books, and the phone was unplugged. An hour passed with no relief in sight. 
Help wasn't coming, but something else was. From the patio doors beyond the nearly solid wall of rain, Mrs. Gordon was able to make out the shape of a hulking black figure. That's when the whistling began. It was the warped ring around the rosy tune, and it didn't stop when the creature darted away. It was gone as quickly as it appeared, zipping between trees as it circled the cabin. They would catch glimpses of it, even closer from a different window only to watch it vanish before their eyes yet again. All the while, they were moving as well, but they weren't consciously aware of being herded. Finally, as they stood grouping near the sliding doors, the beast returned, face pressed to the glass. For a brief, but horrifying moment, no one moved. They were frozen in place, looking at the face of evil that they didn't even know existed a day ago. Their paralysis was broken suddenly by the sound of shattering glass as the whistler came inside and chaos erupted. Rick and Mr. Gordon tried taking aim, but the creature moved too fast in a crowded room. In seconds, the young woman was being carried through the shattered doors out into the raging storm. The poor girl's boyfriend ran after her and leapt onto the whistler's back with a proud but ultimately useless roar of angry defiance. With the couple in the way, no shots could be fired as the mortifying silhouette disappeared into the wall of rain. The parents could do nothing to shield their children from the screams that came next, but they ended quickly. The creature did not return, and when the storm finally passed three hours later, rangers were sent to the occupied campgrounds to perform wellness checks. When they found Rick, he and the family told them everything, all the way down to the whistler's red eyes, round, contracting mouth, and horrible smell. But the main point they stressed was the whistling. You'd think that they would warrant an investigation or something. Two people were dead. The creature they saw up close clearly was not human, but animals cannot whistle, especially not a distorted song. A big fuss was raised for the Gordon's sake. They would be attending family therapy sessions for up to ten years because of that night. Management was terrified of the implications that might arise from the fact that this all happened while a park ranger stood five feet away. But once those people left, that was the end of it. I don't find that surprising. I would never want to think about that experience ever again. Rick wasn't willing to answer any of my questions. I'm not sure if he told me this story to warn me up about the Whistler, management, or secrecy, but I think it was intended as a friendly warning. Who knows what I could have learned if I would have taken longer to replace Amy. From that night alone, I also heard a dozen examples of hikers being stalked on the trails and campers being tormented in the night. One story even sounded like the couples from Mississippi, the ones who basically played red light, green light with the invisible thing, but none of the other stories came close to that one on the lake. Thankfully, I've had one personal incident since my last encounter, and that's all. It happened to me and my new partner in the damn fog yesterday. Chris had to drop out of college to help care for his sick mother. He and his sister are doing their best, but he needs to get the hell away from the park before the choice is taken away from him. It's one thing for the older roughneck types like myself, but I hate seeing the young ones out there. I know that sounds hypocritical, but at least if I died, my family would mourn with a comfortable insurance payout. His family would have nothing but more debt on top of their broken hearts. I tried to warn Chris delicately at first, but nightmares and whistling didn't faze him nor did Tyler's memorialized Facebook page. Nothing got through to this kid, so I decided to let nature take its course. Most of us learned the hard way, but I didn't expect him to get thrown straight into the deep end. Five of our bigger lodges are rented out to families for their reunions and bigger events. They arrived over the weekend and planned to stay for ten days, but who knows what they'll do now. After breakfast, a husband and wife left for a day of hiking. Though they didn't have a specific route or destination in mind, Jared, the husband, simply told his brothers they would be back from exploring by dinner time. Both were experienced hikers who loved to go camping and hiking and doing all kinds of mountain climbing in their spare time. There was no doubt that they were already dead. 
When the sun had fully set and the couple's food was hours cold, the family began to worry in earnest. As Chris and I passed by on patrol, all five cabins were lit up. In the windows, we saw multiple people pacing on their phones while teenagers hauled flashlights and various supplies out to a dozen men who were hunched over park maps. Our radio crackled to life. At the same time the family noticed us, we were told to wait with them at the lodges. Search and rescue was on the way, and they didn't want to lose anyone else, which is understandable, but difficult to manage. We stood in front of nearly 40 people and said, You can't go looking for your family members because your sense will confuse the dogs. You know, because we couldn't say, They're already dead, but we'd rather perform fake searches than admit the truth. Of course, that was far too easy for a night at the park. The whole bunch reluctantly agreed to stay near the cabins except for the ones who were already gone. Jared's two brothers set off 15 minutes before we arrived, and now three more wanted to bring those guys back. That didn't leave much wiggle room for our options. We had to find those brothers or the other three would be sneaking off under our noses. There are five trails in that area. Four are very easy and used to navigate the park, and the other one is for people who specifically want the full hiking experience. Since the missing couple were avid hikers, the brother chose to start there. Which yes, it was obviously the logical conclusion, but I couldn't help feeling a strong resentment toward them as our flashlights illuminated the rocky, uneven terrain. We set a fast pace. Probably too fast. But I hoped the men were stopping periodically to search for tracks and call out the couple's names. If they had, we would have found them relatively fast. Thirty minutes later, that theory was dead and we were on a split path. Chris wanted to split up. Rookies, am I right? but I shut that shit down fast. We took a closer look at the trail, and there were tracks on the left side that looked fresh. Well, when compared to the other side, I'm not very good at that sort of thing, but I happened to be right on this occasion. We walked for another five minutes before beginning to hear faint voices in the distance. Soon, we could understand their words. They were calling for Jared and Emily. It was the brothers. We had been ready to collapse after the ridiculous pace we kept but finding them gave us a second wind. I shouted their names as we ran, and almost didn't notice the wisp of fog at our feet. My heart dropped into the stomach, like a lead weight, and I came to a dead stop grabbing Chris as I did so. We fell to the ground in a tangle, but it didn't matter. I ignored him continuing calling for the brothers while struggling back to my feet. The rookie didn't understand what was happening, but he followed me in silence as I crept around the next curve and saw huge clouds of pouring white fog enveloping the trees. Roughly twenty feet ahead, the brothers were standing half shrouded in it already. In my desperation to get them away, I said something horribly misleading. We have very important news about your brother. Please come with us. I screamed so loud my voice cracked. The shadowy figures turned their heads and my eyes filled with tears of relief when they began walking towards us away from the goddamn fog. Before they reached us, though, I began walking back. I had to keep us moving, so we wouldn't stop and miss anything. We couldn't stop and discuss. We had to keep going. I didn't plan to stop until we were indoors, but not long after passing where the road split, the brothers didn't leave me much of a choice. They refused to go any further without an explanation. No matter how desperate I was to get them away from there, I just couldn't bring myself to keep their hopes any higher. When your mother needs you, didn't work, I tried. They were spotted near one of the mountain trails a few hours ago. That one did the trick. They resumed walking and I happily did the same. Then Chris opened his mouth and I've never wanted to punch someone so badly in my entire life. You fellas go ahead. I'm going to make sure Mrs. Robinson didn't get lost in this fog. He ran off ignoring every word I said as he went. Who the hell is Mrs. Robinson? You may ask. Oh, she's the imaginary lady we need to check on when a particularly chatty guest doesn't want to let us go. We don't do it often, but you gotta remember we're working night shifts, and if somebody is holding us for a random 30-minute conversation at 3am, you can bet it's a freaking weird one. Hell, some of them would probably fit in on this channel, but I'm not trying to drag you guys along on a tangent. The point is, I couldn't let the fool run off alone, so I had to send the brothers ahead and chase after him. One of the first things I ever said to you guys were just regular people, and that certainly hasn't changed. I followed my partner because he was in danger, and I couldn't leave him behind. 
That being said, I couldn't walk into that fog either. I stopped before reaching the low wispy edges that fanned out around the wall. I begged him to turn back. The last speck of his silhouette was fading, and I knew he was gone forever the moment it did. Then, there was a low, monstrous growl that felt like the sound itself was wind, blowing beneath my skin and through my bones. Tears were already falling down my cheeks as I thought of his sick mother and how his sister would be all alone. The tiny speck of Chris that was left in my peripherals. Chris was magnified through my blurry vision, and even as it continued growing, I thought nothing of it until the screaming began. It wasn't a death wail. It was the terrified scream of a man who saw something absolutely horrible, and it made me smile. Soon Chris will be beyond that wall, still screaming, and the utter look of relief that crossed his face upon seeing me made him look six years old. However, briefly, it was gone in the same instant, replaced by guilt and shame. He almost fell while trying to look back, and only then did I realize the big question. The one you guys are probably going to ask immediately. Is something chasing him? No, it wasn't. Not this time, but he might not be so lucky next time. Or me either, for that matter. We radioed the others that we were heading back, and Chris stared at his feet while trying to explain he would never, never ever have forgiven himself if they turned those brothers away. And it cost the hikers their own lives. I already knew that. That's why we all pull stupid stunts in the beginning. But I wanted to know what happened in the fog. He only intended to walk straight for a few minutes, but it was less than 60 seconds when the ground suddenly disappeared along with everything below his knees. The fog was too thick to even see his outstretched hand, and that was enough to make him turn back, except as he did something heavy, suddenly ran several steps toward him. Chris jumped, spinning around as he searched for the source, but there was only fog everywhere he looked. Even worse, he lost his sense of direction and had no clue which way he had originally been facing. Scared of going the wrong way, he stood in place and called to me, but I never heard him. While listening for a response, he took a few steps forward and noticed it was slightly easier to see. Wanting to be out of the fog more than anything, he went a little further until the ground was visible again. That's when he heard a crunching sound, like a dog with a bone, and the occasional meaty rip. That's when he saw it. The whistler sucked up an intestine like spaghetti, but the visible body parts were not gender specific. He doesn't know if it was Jared or Emily, and if this ruins spaghetti for you, I sincerely apologize. Chris backed away slowly at first, but then a whimper escaped his throat and the creature stopped eating. My incredibly lucky-to-be-alive partner screamed and ran away without looking back. It was nothing short of a miracle that he happened to run in the right direction. I don't understand why we could not hear each other's screams in the beginning, but we could at the end. Of course, I don't understand most of this stuff, but some things make even less sense than usual. Eventually, we passed the search and rescue teams on their way to secure the fog with their fancy automatic rifles. I bet the family didn't see it. The wall didn't begin to disperse until dawn, and by then there wasn't even blood left in the grass. The family extended their stay indefinitely while the search continues, but Chris and I are being moved as far away as possible so we won't be tempted to answer any of the guests' persistent questions. I'm not complaining. Even if I tried to warn them, they wouldn't believe me. People like that would go straight to my boss claiming I tried to scare them away or something equally ridiculous. It's safer and easier to avoid the spotlight. Well, that's all I have for now. I'm sorry there isn't more, but I didn't want to wait any longer to send this in. As much as I love writing to you, I won't be heartbroken if things are slow for a while. It might be cool to research other past incidents. Maybe I could map the events on a timeline to see if any unusual patterns or connections emerge. Anyway, thanks again, everyone. You guys have really made this whole situation bearable. Sometimes, I wonder how many other people had their sanity saved by this channel. One of the other stories described it as coming home to a big house full of your friends, and that's exactly what it feels like for me. Thanks for listening. 
Dead in the Woods by Plated Lead One. Years ago, I moved from a tiny town to a remote valley in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by a national forest and a few neighbors. It was just what I'd always wanted. At that point in my life, I had been a paramedic for about five or six years. Being outdoorsy and civic-minded, I volunteered with a local search and rescue organization. For being such a small, poorly funded organization, we were surprisingly busy. In the nine years I was with them, we had at least one rescue, sometimes several, every weekend from spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was roughly the 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bikes and quad riders. So when they'd inevitably get lost or wreck or injured, we'd go out, help them, and track them down. Provide medical care if we need to and fly them on a helicopter or put them on a Stokes basket mounted to a janky freaking trailer that we'd pull them with a quad. About two weeks after joining, with zero training beyond what I had learned as a boy scout and a medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a party member. For some reason, they had put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and they took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead about four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They set out again on foot looking for him for about four or five hours. Then they gave up and called 911. The interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was fairly impressive. No more than 20 or 30 minutes, but we were already eight or nine hours behind the actual ball. So we did a quick briefing distributed maps, divided into a couple of teams, and then set off into the woods. They put me on a quad with the most experienced guy and we headed out. The plan was for each two to three person team to take one of the longer trails that ringed the place. It basically was a massive loop. Then after searching those, we'd systematically work our way into the shorter, more maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was a hasty search as they would call it. None of that grid search crap. We were riding around looking for clues. I don't really know what I expected exactly. Maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were highly rugged, technical trails that you would have to know what you were doing and where you were going or you'd never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and cell phones were crapshoot and the maps didn't account for all the random trails riders would just, you know, kind of make on their own. The only marked roads were fire breaks and mileage-wise, those accounted maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put at the front of the group is honestly still a mystery. Just four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted, and I'm just freaking done. We take a water break and I hear broken radio traffic and what sounds like the bike has been found, but there's no rider. It's only a few miles away from us, so we head in that direction. When we get there, the bike is off on the side of the road along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is dead. Lips blue, skin dusky, arms spread out like a cross. At first glance, his eyes looked wide open in solid white, but when I examined him, I could see his eyes were covered with fly eggs. The dude had been dead for a while. It didn't really make sense though. His, his bike still had gas, water, and food, and he was a healthy guy just in his late 20s. Why was he dead? It looked like he had laid down his bike, run into the woods, and, you know, I guess died. We wrapped him in blankets, put him on the stokes, and took him to the trailhead where the coroner awaited. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked him what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysthemia secondary to extreme anxiety. So the guy died of fright, which I had always assumed was Hollywood BS up until that point. I've always wondered what was going through his head though. Was he afraid of the woods or of being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? Part of me thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard many stories about weird stuff in the woods and I've seen a few strange things myself so it wouldn't surprise me. I really wanted to share this story though with everybody here in the swamp because it's one of those head scratchers that I've never really been able to figure out. App Trail Camping Gone Wrong by Hiking Chick 9 
I had been planning this trip for quite some time, and now that I was finally here, hiking deep within the Appalachian Trail, I felt truly invigorated for the first time in a, quite a while. The fresh air and the beauty of the wilderness surrounding me was exhilarating, and I was filled with a sense of adventure. I had my backpack full of essentials, my tent, and all the equipment that I would need to spend a few nights out in the woods. I'd always been a fan of hiking and camping, and I felt like I was truly in my element. But as the days started to fade into dusk, I felt a sudden change in the air around me. The temperature seemed to drop, and the once calm forest was now filled with a sense of dread. I felt like I was being watched, and the hairs on the back of my neck began to stand up. I tried to shake out the feeling, but as I continued walking, the sense of unease only grew more and more intense. As the sun disappeared beyond the horizon, I decided it was time to set up camp for the night. I found a clearing and quickly set up my tent. I built a small fire to keep me warm and settled down for the night. However, as I lay in my sleeping bag, I could hear something moving just outside my tent. At first, I really did try to assume it was a wild animal but the more I listened, the more I realized it was not an animal at all. The footsteps were far too heavy and too slow. It sounded like a human, but I was miles away from any civilization. I tried to tell myself that I was just being paranoid, but the footsteps continued throughout the night, and I barely slept a wink. By morning, I was exhausted, and I decided to pack up and move on. But as I started walking, the footsteps started up again only this time they were louder and faster and they seemed to be coming from all directions. I quickened my pace, trying to shake off the feeling of being followed, but no matter how fast I walked, the footsteps somehow kept up with me. They were getting closer and closer and I could hear them breathing heavily. I turned around, but I couldn't see anything. It was as if I was being chased by something that was invisible, but I could hear it all around me. Panic sat in and I started to run, my heart pounding in my chest violently, but the footsteps only seemed to grow louder and more frenzied. I knew that I couldn't outrun whatever was chasing me, but I couldn't see anything. I stumbled and then I fell, and as I lay on the ground, I could feel the breath of something cold and damp on the back of my neck. I closed my eyes, waiting for the inevitable to happen, but then, as suddenly as it had started, the footsteps had stopped. I opened my eyes and I was once again alone, surrounded by forest. I could hear nothing but the sound of my own breathing got up, trembling with fear, and continued walking. I never looked back, and I never spoke of what happened with anyone, but to this day I could still hear those footsteps haunting me, and reminded me of the terror I felt deep within the Appalachian Trail. Something is not right about this trail, by Anonymous. I had been planning this trip for a long, long time. Ever since I was a young teen and I had really gotten into hiking with my friends, I had learned about the Trans-American Trail, and I knew that it was a goal of mine to definitely hike, especially if I ever wanted to actually fully do the Triple Crown of hiking. So I was really excited when I finally got to the trail and started hiking it. The beauty of the American landscape was genuinely awe-inspiring, and I was filled with a sense of adventure. I had my backpack full of essentials, and I knew that it would be a great few nights out in the wilderness. However, as I continued my journey, I began to stumble upon signs that something was kind of off about this area, and then I would stumble upon something that made my blood run cold. I had been hiking for hours at this point when I finally came across a clearing in the woods. At first, I thought it was going to be a peaceful place, especially to set up camp and stuff, but as I stepped closer... I could see that it was littered with strange symbols and markings like I had kind of seen earlier, but these ones were more pronounced and a little creepier. It looked like there may have been like dried blood inside of them. There were strange totems made of bones and sticks, and the air was thick with an eerie sense of foreboding. It was as if I had stumbled upon a place of worship, but it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was straight out of a movie. As I continued to explore the area, I came across a group of people dressed in long robes. They had their faces covered, and they seemed to be chanting in unison. I couldn't understand what they were saying, but the words sounded foreign and guttural. I was suddenly filled with a sense of dread, and I knew that I had to leave this place as quickly as I could. 
I know, it's like cliche, but we've all seen the movies. I knew that moment that I saw a group of people chanting something I didn't understand that I had to get the heck out of there. But as I turned to leave, one of the cult members apparently noticed me. They stopped chanting and started to walk towards me with purpose. Their eyes were filled with an intense gaze. I can't even begin to try to explain to you the feelings that I was feeling when I met this guy's eyes. I tried to back away, but I felt as if I was rooted to the spot. The cult member started to speak to me, but I couldn't understand a single word of what they were saying. It was as if they were speaking in tongues, and the more they spoke, the more my fear grew. Suddenly, the other cult members joined in, their voices rising in an ominous chorus. Tried to run, but my feet were far too heavy and my body felt weak. It was as if they had some kind of hold over me, and I was powerless to resist. As they closed in on me, I could see their eyes were filled with a strange hypnotic light. I knew that I was in danger, and I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. But, just as suddenly as they all appeared, a flash of white light appeared in front of me, and then everybody was gone. They had all just vanished, leaving me alone in the clearing, with no sounds but my own frantic breathing and crying. I ran as fast as I could, not daring to look back a single time. I didn't stop until I had reached the safety of my car, which was quite a few miles away at this point. But I knew that there was nothing that was going to keep me out on that trail overnight. I know what I'd experienced was entirely real and I knew that I had come face to face with something truly evil or not of this world. The cult told on me had been broken, but I knew that I would never forget the fear and horror that I experienced on the Trans-American Trail. Some people think that this may have been some sort of alien encounter, maybe some sort of residual paranormal, you know, experience, or maybe I did just see something that we can't explain, maybe some sort of interdimensional uh, kind of strange experience. It's really hard to put words to this, but if anybody in the comments has any idea as to what I experienced, please let me know. Rare Mountain Lion Encounter in the Cascades by Northeast Legend I have always enjoyed hiking in the Cascade Mountains. I mean, how can you not? The crisp air, towering trees, and breathtaking views never fail to leave me in awe. Today was no different. As I made my way up the trail, I couldn't help but feel a sense of peace and tranquility wash over me. But my sense of peace was shattered when I saw... Something that I didn't think even existed here anymore. A mountain lion. It was crouched low to the ground, eyes fixed on me. My heart was pounding with anxiety. I had read about what to do in this situation, but actually, appl but actually applying it was much easier said than done. I knew that I needed to make myself look bigger and make loud noises to scare it off. Or at least I was hoping so in that moment. I lifted my arms above my head hoping to appear as large as possible, and began to shout and clap my hands. But the mountain lion didn't budge. It continued to stare at me, its eyes unwavering and seemingly soulless. Suddenly, like a bat out of hell, it lunged towards me, teeth bared. I stumbled backwards, barely managing to avoid its attack. I could feel my heart racing faster and faster as I realized the gravity of the situation before me. This, this wasn't a warning. The mountain lion was really trying to kill me. I tried to back away slowly, but the mountain lion was far too quick and it kept coming after me. I could feel the top breath of my face as it growled and snarled inches away from me. My heart was pounding so hard that I thought it might burst out of my chest at any second. Once again, I tried to back away, but I tripped on a rock and fell to the ground. This was my worst nightmare and not an advantageous position to be. I could feel the sharp pain suddenly out of nowhere as this thing sunk its teeth into my arm. I began to scream hoping that someone would hear me but the only response was the mountain lion's angry growls. I knew that I was probably going to die here if I didn't do something quickly but what the heck was I going to do? As I searched around frantically, I noticed that there was a nearby rock. I grabbed it and tried my best to strike the mountain lion with it. I hit it with all my strength. It seemingly yowled in pain and let go of me just for a brief second. Enough time for me to scramble to my feet and run as fast as I possibly could. But the mountain lion again was not done with me yet. It chased after me, its powerful legs propelling it forward at an incredible speed, something I could never match. I once again could feel its hot breath on my back as I ran, my heart pounding in my chest. 
Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, I saw a ranger station in the distance. I sprinted towards it, hoping that someone would be there to help me. As I burst through the door, I collapsed on the ground, grasping for air, trying to be able to calm down and explain what happened. The ranger called for an ambulance and I was rushed to the hospital. I had a couple deep cuts on my arms and legs and I was covered in bruises, but ultimately I was alive and I was very lucky to be so. That day in the Cascade Mountains was the scariest experience of my life and I will never forget the fear that I felt as the mountain lion sunk its teeth into me. I'm grateful to be alive and I'm glad that it was a very basic attack because it could have been much worse. Apparently, there have been some issues with a juvenile mountain lion that was relocated to this area, and I'm pretty sure I was attacked by him, unfortunately. Potentially, he was not as accustomed to hunting as maybe he was once thought to be, and he saw me as an easy meal and tried to, you know, try his best. But luckily, I survived. I, I hold no grudge against wild animals. I'm not scared of bears or mountain lions in the slightest, and I don't hate them because of this experience. But I will tell you, Try to be as careful as you can, be as vigilant as possible, and always carry some sort of protection, especially some sort of spray that will be your best friend in these situations. I think I met a skinwalker by Andrew H. I had always enjoyed hiking, you know, like most other people, and especially going to my local state park and enjoying the dense forest, the chirping of birds, and the fresh air. It always made me feel alive. I didn't live in a terribly big city, but I still had the same stresses as a big city. But little did I know, going out to try to enjoy myself one fateful day, I would encounter something that would forever change my life, and the way I viewed the earth. It was a beautiful autumn morning when I decided to head out for a hike. The leaves had turned to a beautiful orange and the sun was shining brightly. I packed my backpack, laced up my hiking boots, and headed out onto the trail. I was alone, but I didn't really mind. The solitude of the forest was comforting for me. Like I said, it was almost like some sort of therapy. After a couple of hours of hiking, I noticed something strange. It was as if the forest had fallen eerily silent. There were no birds chirping anymore, no rustling of leaves, nothing of that sort. Cliché, right? I couldn't help but feel a bit uneasy, but as I brushed it off, thinking that maybe it was just my imagination or me overthinking, I suddenly heard another strange sound. It was like a low growl coming from the bushes. Since it was so quiet, it was very audible and noticeable. My heart was thumping already, but now it began to race as I peered through the branches, trying to see what was making the noise. And that's when I saw it. It was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It had the body of a coyote, but its eyes were, well, they were like humans, and its fur was jet black. It looked straight at me, and I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. I tried to run, but my legs felt like lead. I was stumbling on the rocky path, and eventually I fell to the ground. I looked back, and the creature was still there staring at me with those piercing eyes. It hadn't seemingly moved a single inch. That's when I realized I think I knew what I was seeing, something that I had only heard in podcasts and on online documentaries. This, this was a skimwalker. I got up as quickly as I could, absolutely hauling ass out of there, hoping that I could outrun this creature. Suddenly, it began to spring into action after me. It was fast, and it was getting closer to me than I ever could have imagined was possible. In an instant, I could literally feel this thing on top of me. I didn't know what to do. I was trapped with nowhere to go, stuck on a state park trail that I don't know even where I'm actually at at this point because I wasn't looking at any trail markers because I was terrified. I remember something I had heard back in an old Swamp Dweller story. It was something along the lines that skimwalkers couldn't really cross running water. I don't know if it was either some physical thing, if it was some sort of you know, spiritual thing, but I decided that it couldn't hurt. If I was going to die, I was going to die. I looked around, and luckily, I noticed that there was a stream nearby. It was my only hope. I sprinted towards the stream, jumped over it, landing on the other side, and I looked back. Suddenly, it seemed like the skimwalker was gone. I couldn't believe it. I had somehow survived. That's when I noticed that it was no longer chasing me, not because of the stream, but because there was a bunch of other hikers coming up. 
Now, I don't know if it was just planning on going after them. I never heard of any other stories after this, but I was grateful that I had been able to get out of this encounter without dying. I jumped back over the creek, made my way back to my car, my heart still pounding the entire time, looking behind me every two seconds. I never went hiking alone again, and I had learned my lesson the hard way. The forest may be beautiful, but it can also be a very dangerous place, and you never know what might be lurking in the shadows. So swamp folk, be careful. Don't be like me, and don't get chased by something because you just thought you were safe because, you know, it's quiet and peaceful. There are other dangers out there like bears, mountain lions, and all kinds of other monsters. So, just keep your head on a swivel. Hi Swamp Dweller, I just want to let you know that this podcast rocks and I hope it stays up for years to come. While listening to one of your latest episodes concerning crime, memories popped up in my head about the times me and my brother would hike together. For context, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and try to escape the city life on the weekends by hiking in the mountains, exploring old sewage systems, and, my favorite, taking trips down into the Rio Salado to explore the swampy desert habitat and see what has changed. Things have changed since I last went, and now I don't really want to go back at all. It was a moderately warm Sunday when we set out to hike down the rocky trails. I had just gotten my driver's license and was excited to go driving off places by myself. Luckily, I wasn't alone this time though. As I have said, my two brothers were with me, and I was grateful for it because things had changed. As we continued down the trails, I realized that the amount of trash had doubled. Plastic bottles, Safeway bags, and every possible litter imaginable was strewn about and dried in the riverbed. In the past, we had tried to clean some of it up, but now it would be pointless unless we had an entire team on the job. Further down the trail, a ranger came walking up. She turned into our trail and then walked across it into another, heading towards a homeless man that was... I don't know what he was doing. A tent was set up and he was kicking around some trash. She talked to him for a little while before departing. She headed back up the trail, going right past us, while the homeless man disappeared over a giant mound of dirt. Another homeless man had set up his tent nearby and he was eyeing us. He vanished into his tent and we decided that it was best to leave this area. We hiked back the way we had came and left the trail farther back, which led us to the riverside. There we found an aluminum can with a lizard trapped inside of it, portraying how this pollution was affecting the environment. I've come across several of these situations down here. Once it was the same can design and same lizard species weird, but we ended up slicing open the can to release him, because the opening was too small for them to squeeze back through. But as we sauntered down the riverside, we came across another tent and a mound of toilet paper and human feces. We turned back and decided to head back down the river again, but we ended up running into another homeless guy on the other side of the river, washing himself and drinking. We soon left and went back up to the main trail, hiking past the mound of dirt the first homeless guy had walked all the way around it and ended up making his way back up the main trail. My teenage brothers are usually careful and don't mess around, but this time the youngest one climbed up to the top of the dirt mound and looked down. Hey, there's a tent down here, he said. Get down, said my other brother, but he didn't. Instead, he continued down towards it, not even sure if someone was in there. Get your ass down here. I whispered fiercely. Since we were underneath a giant bridge, my voice echoed. My brother took no head. Instead, he picked up a rock and tossed it toward the tent. That was it. I marched up the mound and yanked my brother down, pushing him aside. He got really pissed at me though, but he was being an idiot. Tampering around with homeless people's tents? Time to get to higher ground, I thought. Then maybe home, especially after that had happened. We continued upwards and found many more tents and piles of pornographic magazines and rusty needles. I hoped that if we got into a confrontation with one of these homeless people, he would let us pass. But many years had passed since I had explored this part, so things were much different now compared to the last. As we reached a cluster of mesquite trees, we saw another homeless man. Except it wasn't some short guy in a tent. This guy must have been 6'4", and he was no stork. He was well built and muscular. He glanced toward us then disappeared, but I had my head turned and didn't see which direction he went, but I knew it was time to go, especially with another homeless man slowly gaining on us. 
We fled into the brush, which had many tent-like structures slung over branches, but surprisingly there wasn't really anybody there. This labyrinth of polluted brush with a thorny canopy overhead went on for quite some distance, but that's when we heard something following us. I turned to my brothers. Did you hear that? They both nodded. Probably just thinking it was a rabbit or something to rationalize things in our brain so we didn't freak out further, we continued to crawl through the thorn bushes. But whatever was making those noises was getting closer and louder. I was pretty sure that it wasn't a rabbit at this point. It was big, much bigger than a coyote. It sounded like a human being, and it was crashing through the brush, getting faster and more intense. We could hear the footsteps in the dry leaves behind us. Run, I whispered, and we crawled, ran, squeezed, and scratched ourselves as we retreated blindly into the briars and bushes. Whatever it was had gotten even closer and louder. At this point, we had our knives pulled and were getting tired. If this person caught up, it would be our last resort, and we were ready. There, one of my brothers pointed. The bushes began to clear, and there appeared to be a way out of this dangerous maze. We literally threw ourselves out and scrambled up the side of a slanted boulder wall to escape the stalker. As soon as we made it out into the clearing, the guy had stopped his pursuit and crashed back through the brush. When we saw the park ranger's truck parked further down the trail over the wall, we knew we were safe again. But we didn't report anything to her. I mean, who would believe us? Instead, we trekked all the way back up and ran across the parking lot, piling into our Ford Focus. I haven't made any recent trips there to go hiking, and I don't plan on hiking there anytime soon. Ghostly Chase on the Pier by Guilty Moose 70 The sun was beginning to set as I arrived at the old wooden pier. The sound of the waves lapping against the shore was soothing and I couldn't wait to cast my line and feel the thrill of reeling in a big catch. The pier that had always been my favorite place to fish with its secluded location and peaceful ambiance. As I set up my gear, I noticed a strange mist from the sea. It was a dense, thick, opaque fog that crept over the pier like a ghostly hand. I shrugged it off at first, thinking it was just the evening chill setting in. But something felt off as I settled into my spot and cast my line. I couldn't shake that feeling that I was just being watched. The mist seemed to swirl and shift whenever I glanced around, like a sinister presence looking beyond my sight. I tried to ignore it the best I could, focusing on my fishing, but the feeling grew more assertive. And then, as I reeled in my line, I caught a glimpse of something in the mist. It was faint, a shadowy figure if you will like a ghostly form hovering just beyond the fog. I froze, unsure really what to do. Was it my imagination, or was there actually something there? As I watched, the figure grew closer, and its features became more distinct. It was a woman with long, dark hair. She was pale, almost translucent in complexion. She floated just above the water, her eyes fixed on me with an eerie intensity. I tried to rationalize it, thinking it was a trick of the light or some sort of reflection in the water. But as the figure grew closer, I could feel the cold, damp air around me, and the hairs on the back of my neck began to stand up. I tried to back away, but before the figure seemed to follow me, its eyes never left mine. She contacted me, trying to communicate something I could not understand. As the mist grew thicker, the figure grew closer its expression twisting into something dark and menacing. I could feel a sense of dread washing over me, a feeling of impending doom, and then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the figure vanished into thin air. I was left standing there, my heart racing and my mind reeling. Had it been real? Was this just some sort of hallucination brought on by the fog? I hadn't drank, I, I don't smoke, and I definitely got a good night's sleep. As I packed up my gear and headed home, I could not shake the feeling that something was just watching me, something sinister and otherworldly lurking just beyond the veil of reality, and I knew from that day forward I would never be able to fish on that pier again without the fear of that ghostly figure haunting me forever. Catching More Than We Bargained For by Anonymous I never thought I'd be the kind of person to break the law. 
but the thought of catching a monster-sized fish was too tempting to resist. So when my friend told me about a private lake where he had heard rumors of fish that weighed more than 100 pounds, I just couldn't resist. We decided to sneak in at night, thinking we wouldn't get caught. It wasn't long before we found ourselves at the edge of the lake, our rods in hand and our hearts pounding excitedly. The lake was completely still. The only sounds were the occasional chirping of crickets and the soft lapping of the water against the shore. As we cast our lines into the water, I couldn't help but feel like we were doing something wrong. But the thrill of the catch was way too much to ignore. After only a few minutes' time, I felt a tug on my line. I reeled it in as fast as possible, my heart pounding excitedly, thinking I got something good. But as the fish approached the surface, I realized something was not quite right here. The fish was gigantic, but it also was covered in strange, pulsating bumps. As I got a closer look at it, I saw that they were not just bumps, but rather they were growth. It was clear that this fish was sick and suffering. I couldn't bring myself to even touch it, let alone keep it. The sight of it was too much for me to bear. I cut my line and sat back down on the shore, racing about what could have caused such a grotesque mutation. But then I heard something that made my blood run absolutely cold. It was a loud growl coming from somewhere behind me. I turned slowly my heart pounding in my ears. That's when I saw it. It was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen in my lifetime. The body was covered in matted fur. Its eyes glinted in the moonlight. It looked like a wolf but was much larger, and something about how it moved made me feel like it was not entirely natural. I realized right then and there that we were not alone in this place. We were trespassing in the territory of some kind of monster, and it was clear that it was not happy about it. My friend and I ran as fast as we could. We were never thinking about looking back, hearts pounding, literally felt like we were going to die at any second. We didn't stop until we were back in our car, and even then, we didn't feel safe. We hauled it out of there. That night, I realized that there are some things better left unseen. The memory of that mutated fish and the creature we encountered in the woods will haunt me for the rest of my life. But it wasn't until a few days later that I discovered the true horror of what we had stumbled upon. I was scrolling through the news on my phone when I came across a story about a local laboratory that had been shut down due to illegal experiments on animals. The laboratory was allegedly just a few miles away from that private lake where we had gone fishing. The article described the experiments as gruesomely, including creating animal mutants through genetic manipulation. My stomach churned as I made the connection. The sick fish we had seen and the unnatural creature in the woods were all the result of a legal experiment that had taken place at that laboratory, and I was sure of it. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had narrowly escaped something far worse that night, and I couldn't help but wonder what other horrors were hidden in the woods around us, waiting to be discovered by unsuspecting visitors like ourselves. A Trip to Paradise by I am Kyle. I had always dreamed of going on a fishing trip to the Florida Keys, so I jumped at the chance and my buddies invited me to join them on a weekend trip. We arrived at our rented house on the water's edge on a Friday's evening, and ready to spend the next two days catching some big fish, we were all very amped. The house was a charming old beachfront cottage with peeling blue paint and a wraparound porch that faced the water. It had three small bedrooms, a cozy living room, and a fully equipped kitchen. We were absolutely thrilled to find that we had a dock in the backyard with a small motorboat tied to it, which was perfect for our fishing trip. The first day went by smoothly. We woke up early and headed out to the ocean with our gear, and within just a few hours we caught some decent sized fish. We decided to head back to the house to cook our catch and rest up for another day on the water. That night, things began to feel odd. Sitting around the campfire, we heard strange noises from the nearby woods. Something was moving around there, but we couldn't see anything with the darkness. We shrugged it off as just some local wildlife or fauna and went to bed. We woke up early the following day and returned to the water. This time, however, things felt different. It was hard to put my finger on it. The water was choppier, the sky was overcast, and the eerie silence hung over everything. It was like the world was holding its breath. 
As we started to fish, I noticed the water was murky and dark, almost like it was hiding something that it didn't want to show. But we kept at it, hoping to catch something big. That's when everything started to go terribly wrong. My friend Jack suddenly yanked on his fishing line and we all rushed over to see what he had caught. But when we looked closer, we noticed it wasn't a fish at all. It, it was a human hand. Now, of course, we were all horrified. We had no idea what the heck to do. We quickly pulled into the line, hoping that it was just a fluke, but as we continued to fish, we kept pulling up more and more human remains. Bones, limbs, even a skull. We knew we had to get out of there and bring this to the police ASAP, but as we tried to start the engine to get away, of course, in a cliche manner, it wouldn't freaking start. We were trapped on the boat with this gruesome discovery and there was no way out. That's when we saw a figure moving through the water towards us. It was a man, but he was covered in seaweed and algae, and his eyes were cold and dead. He started to climb up onto the boat and we all stumbled back in terror. We fought back as best as we could, honestly we did. We used any fishing rods, anything we could to poke and prod this man to get him off, but he was relentless. His movements were jerky and unnatural. He started to lunge at us, trying to bite us with his sharp, broken teeth, and then we realized this was no man at all. He was some sort of creature from the deep. We tried to reason with it, to plead with it to let us go, but it was too late. The creature was upon us, trying to tear at our flesh with whatever claws and teeth it had. It was like a nightmare come to life, a creature straight out of a movie, like the creature from the Black Lagoon. I don't know how we all survived that day. I don't know how we made it back to shore, but luckily, one of us finally got the boat moving. We were able to use the momentum of the boat jerking and everything we had to push to knock it out into the water. We started hauling ass and did everything we could to save our lives. We did some digging after we got to shore and tied up the boat. We locked all the doors, of course, all the windows made sure nothing could get in after we, you know, experienced whatever the heck we experienced, and we did see that there had been a series of disappearances in the area and that a creature had been encountered by many, many people. But the memory never fades from me. I'll never forget that thing. A lot of people think that this monster is some sort of local urban legend, but I know it's real. I don't know if people will believe me and I don't really care. I know what I experienced. State Park Fishing Nightmare by Tony M. It was a pretty hot summer day and I decided to take a break from the city and spend some time fishing at the local state park. I packed my gear and drove to the park, eager to relax and enjoy the peaceful surroundings. As I arrived, I noticed there was a small group of people standing near the water. They looked like they were in their mid-twenties, and they all wore black robes with hoods that covered their faces. I thought it was kind of weird, but, you know, people LARP and do all kinds of stuff like that around here, so I tried not to pay too much notice. They didn't seem to notice me as I walked by, but I couldn't shake that feeling that something was off about them. I found a quiet spot by the water and cast my line. The fishing was good and I caught several fish within the first hour. But every time I looked up, I noticed that that group of people in the black robes had moved closer. They seemed to be watching me and it made me uncomfortable. As the day went on, the group of people grew larger and more of them arrived in the park. They all wore black robes and hoods and they all seemed to be focused on me. I felt like I was being stalked, like I was some sort of local celebrity. As the sun began to set, the group of people moved closer once more. They formed a circle around me and I felt trapped. They were so close that I could see their faces now, and they looked strange and almost otherworldly. Their eyes were dark and hollow. They had strange markings on their skin. One of the people stepped forward and spoke to me in a low, hissing voice. We've been waiting for you, they said. You're in the sacrifice. I, I tried to run, but they were too quick. They tripped me up and grabbed me and dragged me into the woods, their voices echoing in my head. I was terrified and confused. What the hell was happening to me? As we entered the woods, I saw that they had built some sort of makeshift altar out of stones and twigs. They pushed me onto it and I felt a sharp pain in my chest as they began to chant. I almost couldn't move. I almost began to feel paralyzed. I don't know if it was with fear or something else. Suddenly, the chanting abruptly stopped and the group of people looked up. I heard a deep growling coming from the woods, and then I saw a pair of glowing eyes in the darkness. 
The group of people panicked and ran, leaving me alone on the altar. I looked up and I saw a massive creature standing over me. It had razor-sharp claws and teeth, and it was covered in what I can only describe as disturbing-looking fur. I realized that the group of people had summoned it, and they had intended to sacrifice me to it. The creature looked down at me, and I felt its hot breath on my face. I closed my eyes and waited for the end, but instead I heard a deep, rumbling growl. When I opened my eyes again, the creature was gone, and I was alone in the woods. I stumbled back to my car, shaken up and absolutely terrified. As I drove away from the state park, I realized the group of people had been worshipping something beyond human understanding, and that creature was likely whatever god they had been praying to. I don't know why it didn't kill me. I have no idea why their sacrifice didn't go as intended. My only guess is, is that it went after them or something else. If anybody has any idea what I, what I survived, what I got out of, please let me know. The Ohio Wild Man Attacked Me by Billy Goes Fishing, Ohio I had been looking forward to this fishing trip on a remote river in Ohio for quite some time. I had looked forward to packing up my gear, including my kayak and my GoPros, to make some cool YouTube videos. When the day came, I set out early in the morning to beat the heat. As I paddled down the river, the only sounds were the gentle lapping of the water against the kayak and the chirping of birds in the trees. It was peaceful and serene, and I felt completely alone in the world. The only noises were the occasional narration I'd add in my video. But as I rounded a bend in the river, I saw something that shattered that feeling of solitude. It was a man, but more like a wild man, standing on the bank, staring at me with this absolutely crazy look in his eyes. He was covered in dirt and leaves, and his hair was matted and unkempt. He looked like he had been living in the woods for years, and I wondered how he had survived without any human contact for so long. I tried my best to paddle away, but he lunged at me with surprising speed, and before I knew it, he had flipped my kayak. I tumbled into the water, gasping for air and struggling to stay afloat. The wild man swam towards me, and I could see the hunger in his eyes. This wasn't an unprovoked attack, I was food. I tried to swim away, and I lost my GoPro in the process but he was too fast for me to start worrying about that now. He grabbed me by the ankle, and I felt his sharp nails digging into my skin. I began screaming for help, but there was no one around to help me. Nobody was going to hear me. I fought back with everything I had, but he was so strong. I could feel my strength fading as he dragged me towards the shore. As we reached the bank, I saw that he had built a makeshift shelter out of branches and leaves. He pushed me inside, and I could feel the rough ground against my back. I knew that I was trapped. For hours he taunted me with this wild, incoherent rambling, pacing back and forth in front of the shelter. I could hear the sound of twigs snapping as he moved around, and the sound of his labored breathing as he tried to catch his breath. As night fell, I could see the light of a fire outside the shelter. I could hear the sound of something cooking, and the smell of roasted meat filled my nostrils. I realized with horror that the wild man was preparing to eat me. I knew that I had to escape no matter what it took. I waited until he was distracted by the fire. Then uh, I made my move. I burst out of the shelter and ran towards my kayak, hoping to get away with all of my strength. But again, this wild man was way too fast. He caught up to me and tackled me to the ground instantly. I could feel his hot breath on my face as he prepared to strike. But before he could, I heard the sound of a gunshot. The wild man slumped to the ground dead. I looked to see a park ranger standing over him, gun in hand. He had been tracking the wild man for quite some time apparently and had finally caught up with him. Obviously, he didn't want to kill the man, he really wanted to help him and rehabilitate him, but he saw me in absolute agony, laying there, battered and bruised, needing help, and acted accordingly in my opinion. I realized that I had narrowly escaped death that night. The wild man had almost made me his next meal. This was a reminder of the danger that can lurk in the most unexpected places, even on a peaceful fishing trip down a remote river in Ohio. The Dangers of Remote Fishing by Anonymous I had always been fascinated by the great outdoors and the beauty of nature, so when I heard about Yosemite National Park growing up, I knew I had to go. I packed my gear, and I set out on a hiking and fishing trip. 
Excited to explore the park's crystal clear streams, towering trees, and breathtaking scenery. I had been hiking for quite a few hours, taking in sights and sounds of the forest when I realized that I had lost my way at some point. The trail that had been guiding me seemed to just disappear, and I couldn't find any markers to guide myself back. I tried retracing my steps, but the forest was just too dense, and I couldn't tell which way was which. Panic began to set in, and I began to realize that I was lost. As I walked, I noticed that the trees seemed to be getting closer together, and the forest was becoming darker altogether. The sound of the babbling brook that had been guiding me was fading away slowly, and I was left with an eerie silence that only amplified my fear. After some time, I stumbled upon a clearing, and in the middle of it was an old cabin. It looked abandoned, and I hesitated before going in. The door creaked as I pushed it open, and the smell of mildew hit me. The inside was dusty, and the furniture was covered with cobwebs. It was clear that no one had been here in quite some time. I decided to make camp inside the cabin for the night, hoping to find my way out of the forest in the morning. I was lucky to find a place that was dry. I got a fire going in the fireplace and began to make myself comfortable for the night. And as the warmth of the flames washed over me, I felt a sense of relief. But as the night went on, my sense of safety would begin to fade. The silence was unnerving and I kept hearing strange noises coming from outside the cabin. It sounded like something was walking around the perimeter and I could hear the occasional stamp of a twig or rustling of leaves. I tried to convince myself that it was just some sort of animal, but the fear was too immense. As the night wore on, the noises became more frequent and more prevalent. I realized that I wasn't alone here. I could hear something moving around outside the cabin and it was not my mind playing tricks on me. I felt the sense of dread wash over me. It sounded like something was trying to break in, scratching and clawing at the walls ever so slightly. I tried to ignore it the best I could, but the fear was far too great. I lay in my sleeping bag, heart racing, my eyes darting around the room looking for anything. Every time I thought the noises had stopped and would begin to close my eyes, they would immediately start back up again, even louder and more intense than before. It was like it was playing mind games with me. It knew when I was about to fall asleep. Finally, the noises stopped altogether, and I was left with an even more creepy, eerie silence. I tried to convince myself that everything was okay, but the feeling of unease just lingered. It never really relented. I decided that I couldn't stay in the cabin any longer, and then I had to find my way out of this forest ASAP. As I stepped outside, I saw a figure in the distance standing amongst the trees. It was dark and tall, and it seemed to be staring at me. I immediately stopped, stared right back at it, and the figure vanished into the forest. I ran in the opposite direction, trying to find my way out of the park, but the forest seemed to be alive all around me, and it was as if it was trying to keep me trapped inside its depths. I had heard more strange noises, and I had saw more shadowy figures in the distance. It was like I was living in a nightmare. The night was long, and my body was tired, but I knew I had to keep moving. I stumbled upon a river and followed it. This was my last hope. I was really hoping it would lead me out of the forest, but the river was treacherous and the rocks were slippery. I fell several times, bruising my knees and scraping my hands. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, a lifetime if you will, I saw a faint light in the distance. My heart leapt with hope and I began to run towards it with all I had. As I got closer, I realized that it was a campsite. There were a few tents set up and I could see the glow of a campfire. I stumbled into the camp, gasping for breath, and the campers looked up in surprise. They were a group of three friends who had been hiking in the park for a few days now. They gave me a fair chance and listened to my story, and their faces were full of concern. They offered me a hot meal and a place to sleep for the night, and as I sat by the fire, I felt the tension in my body begin to ease just ever so slightly. I was grateful for their kindness and for the safety of their company. The next morning, I set out with their group, determined to find my way out of the forest. They were experienced hikers and knew the park well, and they helped me navigate the trails. We hiked for a couple of hours, and I could feel the relief wash over me as we got closer to the park entrance. As we emerged from the forest, I looked back at the towering trees, dense undergrowth, and everything that I had gone through, and the fear I had felt the night before seemed distant and unreal, like a dream that had faded with the morning light. I thanked the group for their help profusely and set out on a long journey back home. As I drove away from the park, I couldn't help but think that the strange occurrence of that night before 
Maybe it was just my imagination. Or was there something more sinister lurking in the forest? The memory of that night stayed with me for a long time, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Whenever I thought about it, I would get nightmares. But despite the fear and uncertainty, I knew that I would return to Yosemite National Park one day. The beauty and majesty of the park were too great to resist, the lure of the wilderness was way too strong, and plus I had to go pick up my camping gear eventually. Overnight Camping in the Superstitions by Anonymous I'm a 17-year-old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. The incident occurred six months ago on the overnight trip that I took to the Superstition Mountains, about an hour's drive east of Phoenix. I won't specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you put things on the internet. Whether it's a good course, an abandoned mind, ghost, or whatever it may be, people usually come flocking with a lot of trash and loud music. I took this trail, an eight mile loop through a canyon, a simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but the last minute cancellation on his part left me alone. So with a bag packed and car ready to go, I decided to go independently. Of course, I left the house a little bit late and having trouble navigating through rough forest roads, I didn't arrive at the trailhead until around 5.45, which for those who don't backpack is a huge no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot, and it was getting dark fast, so I figured if I moved quickly enough, I could probably get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. Unfortunately, this strategy left me hiking a dark trail with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Walking in the dark was scary, especially when I was alone in the remote wilderness. Eventually, it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get a camp set up, only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast. I ended up in a less ideal spot than I had wanted, but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle. Hence, it did look like people had been there before, but not any time recently. My priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me, found some dry wood, and got my fire going. I set up my tarp and cracked open a can of chili mac I had brought and was looking forward to eating. I felt good, my camp was set up, and my food was finally on the fire. That uneasy feeling from the hike had almost dissipated entirely, and concern from the walk-in had virtually disappeared. However, it was still there, a side effect of camping alone in remote areas, of course. To fully understand what went down, I have to explain how my camp was set up. I had picked a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with a trail about 30 feet to my left. When you are in the woods with a small fire going, the fire cast a circle of light around it, and everything on the edge of that circle and past it is pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I had seen the rock coming from, but due to the density of the pine trees and brush, I could only see about 10 feet in front of me, and I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line surrounding me searching for any sign of what or whoever had thrown the rock. Not daring to stray too far away from the fire that in hindsight only offered me a false sense of security. Finally, after sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I convinced myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or had fallen from a tree or something of the sense. I went to sleep that night not really knowing what to expect, just ready for pure terror that would unfold at any moment. Instead, I woke up to the rustling of leaves. Barely inaudible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still, in a sleepy daze, I heard the rustling of leaves. Harder to hear as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab the handheld flashlight I had left next to me when I fell asleep. But the more I looked, 
the more I got scared as I realized it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag, ducked out of my tarp, and looked around. I could see the light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight lying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I felt like I almost crapped my pants. The flashlight had been left sitting right next to me when I fell asleep a few hours ago, and now was 15 feet away from me, past the tree line in the woods. I quickly slipped my boots on, clutching my knife in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options, staying here and waiting the night or attempting the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. Whoever was with me would have a better advantage if I was put out on the trail without a light, so I decided I would stay at the camp and wait out the night there. Eventually, it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods once more. It was far off at first, but I could listen to it slowly getting closer. It sounded almost like someone leisurely walking by. Like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes, it would wander too far away for me to hear anything and I would lose track of the steps. But then, maybe an hour or two later, it would return, still faint as ever. This continued for about three or four hours until I listened to the steps get closer and closer until they were easily only five feet away from me. The fire had been tiny at this point, as I had run out of wood. Finally, the footsteps stopped, and everything went silent. I sat there for easily two hours, clutching a knife and praying, taking the knife in my hand and praying that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun illuminated me to see that I was alone at my campsite. I packed my things and sped walked the three miles back down to the trail I had taken. Finally I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in, and drove away. I didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that wretched place. I stopped at a gas station in the Apache Junction to buy a Red Bull, but mostly to see and talk to another human being. As I exited the store, I read what was written in the dust on the back window of my car. It said, Sleep well? Many weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this was the most mysterious and scariest thing that I've ever had happen to me, and I just wanted to share. Surviving a Bear Attack by Johnson Brewer, 1984 As I hiked through the Superstition Mountains, I marveled at the rugged beauty of the desert landscape. Finally, the sun was setting, casting long shadows over the rocky terrain. I had planned to camp out for the night and continue my hike in the morning. As I walked, I saw a clearing up ahead. Uh, I quickened my pace, eager to find a spot to set up my tent before it got too dark. But as I entered the clearing, I froze in terror. There, lying in a pool of blood, was the mutilated body of a deer. Its head had been torn clean off, and its entrails were scattered across the ground. I felt a chill run down my spine, and I couldn't help but wonder what could have done this. As I looked around the clearing, I saw a set of footprints leading away from the scene. They were too big to belong to any animal I knew in these mountains. My heart pounded as I followed the footprints plunging me into the woods. After a few minutes of walking, I heard a low growling sound coming up ahead. My stomach turned as I realized the footsteps must belong to a bear. And not just any bear, a grizzly bear. I wanted to turn back and run as far and as fast as possible, but something compelled me to keep moving forward. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something important I needed to see, even if it meant risking my life. As I crept closer, I saw a cave entrance on the side of a cliff. The growling was coming from inside, but my curiosity got the best of me. I had to know what was in there. I stepped into the cave and the growling grew louder and louder. Finally, my eyes adjusted to the darkness and I saw the outline of a massive grizzly bear. Its eyes glowed in the dark and it bared its teeth at me. I tried to back away slowly, but my foot slipped on a rock and I fell to the ground fairly hard. The bear lunged at me and I closed my eyes expecting the worst. But then, I felt a hand on my shoulder and I opened my eyes to see a man standing over me. 
He was tall and muscular with a wild look in his eyes. He spoke to the bear in a language I didn't recognize and for some reason it backed away snarling. The man helped me to my feet and I saw that he was wearing a necklace made of bones. I realized with a sickening feeling that they were human bones. He grinned at me, showing me his sharp teeth. You're lucky I found you first, he said. The bear would have been a mercy compared to what I would have done to you. I stumbled backward, my heart pounding. I turned and ran as fast as I could. I, I had no idea what this person was planning, but I don't think they ever ended up chasing me. Eventually, I did end up out of the Superstition Mountain safely, but I, I've never returned to those woods, and I don't think I ever will. I can't shake the feeling that I stumbled upon something ancient and dark that's better left alone. Lost in the Superstitions by Anonymous Hiker Bro I was always so adventurous, and hiking in the Superstition Mountains had been one of my bucket list things for a very long time. So, one bright sunny morning, I packed my backpack with all the essentials and set off on my journey. I had heard stories of people getting lost in the Superstition Mountains, but I had researched and was confident in my navigating skills to get through that rugged terrain with no problem. I decided to venture off trail to explore less traveled areas and see things most hikers have yet to experience. As I made my way through the rocky landscape, I began to feel a sense of dread wash over me. The air suddenly grew cold, and I heard strange noises off in the distance. I really did try to brush it off, honestly, telling myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But then, I realized that I had made a wrong turn somewhere along the way, and the trail markers guiding me were nowhere to be seen, and I was completely disoriented at this point. I tried retracing my steps, but everything looked the same, and I couldn't find any recognizable landmarks. As the sun began to set, uh, panic really started to set in. I had no food or water left, and the temperature dropped rapidly. I searched for any sign of civilization, but didn't really find anything. The darkness that enveloped me was absolute, and I could barely see a few feet in front of me. I was lost, alone, and absolutely terrified. The noises around me had grown louder, and I could hear something moving in the shadows. I tried to call out for help, but my voice was weak, and I knew nobody could hear me. As I stumbled through the darkness, I began to feel like I was being watched. Every time I turned around, I saw nothing but eerie darkness. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, and my mind was filled with dread. I don't know how long I wandered through the darkness, but I eventually collapsed from exhaustion, and I honestly don't remember much after that. But all I recall is waking up in a hospital bed. I had been found by a search and rescue team who had been searching for quite a few days. To this day, I don't know what caused me to get lost in the Superstition Mountains, but I do know that it was a terrifying experience that I will never forget. Haunted Cabin in the Mountains by Sean S. The Superstition Mountains had always enticed me. The rugged peaks, the vast expanses of wilderness, and the tales of lost treasure that littered the area all had a certain allure for me. So, when I stumbled upon a small cabin for rent nestled deep in the heart of the mountains, I jumped at the chance to spend a week there. At first, everything was perfect. The cabin was cozy and quaint, with a wood-burning stove and a porch overlooking a stunning vista of jagged peaks and rustling pines. But as the sun began to set each evening, a strange feeling began to creep over me. It was like the cabin was alive and not in a good way. The first night I woke up to the sound of creaking floorboards. At first I assumed it was just the wind, but as the sound grew louder, I knew something was off. I laid there, frozen in fear, as the footsteps grew closer. Finally, they stopped just outside my door in a cliché manner. I held my breath, waiting for whatever was out there to make its move, but nothing ever happened. Eventually, I just fell back asleep, convinced it was my imagination. The next night, things got a bit worse. As I lay in bed, trying to drift off to sleep, 
I heard a strange whispering from the woods outside. At first, it was so faint that I could barely make out the words, but as it grew louder, I could hear a woman's voice pleading for help. I tried to ignore it, but the voice grew insistent until it was all I could hear. The third night was the worst of all. As I lay in bed, I could feel something watching me. It was like eyes boring into my soul from somewhere in the darkness. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe it was just an animal or my overactive imagination. I was somewhat on edge from the past few nights, but the feeling grew stronger. Finally, I mustered the courage to get up and investigate. I searched the cabin from top to bottom, but there was nothing there. No animals, no people, not even a breeze to rustle the curtains. But as I turned back to bed, I saw something moving outside. It was too dark to determine what it was, but I could feel its malevolence seeping through the cabin walls. That was when I realized I was definitely not alone in this place. The rest of my week in that cabin was a blur of terror and confusion. Every single night, I heard strange sounds, saw things moving in the shadows, and felt unshakable dread that I could not explain. When I finally left, I was exhausted frightened and utterly convinced that that cabin was haunted by something beyond human understanding. I shudder whenever I think back on that week in the Superstition Mountains. I will never forget the terror I felt in that haunted cabin, settled deep in the heart of the wilderness. My week of relaxation turned into a week of nightmares. Something Horrifying Ran Me Off the Road by Anonymous I've always been drawn to the supernatural and the unknown. So when I heard about the skinwalker legends of the Superstition Mountains, I knew I had to see for myself. I packed my bags, grabbed my camera, and headed to the mountains, excited to uncover the mysteries ahead. As I drove deeper into the hills, the paved road slowly turned into a winding dirt road. The scenery around me became increasingly isolated with only the occasional cactus or rock formation to break up the monotony of the desert landscape. That's when I saw it. A figure that was standing on the side of the road, its form twisted and contorted in ways that should have been impossible. The eyes shone like yellow orbs in the dark and as I drove closer, I could feel a chill run down my spine. Then suddenly the figure darted out in front of my car, causing me to swerve off the road and crash into a nearby cactus. My head hit the steering wheel and everything went black. When I woke up, the sunset and my car were totaled. I tried to escape, but my legs were pinned under the dashboard and panic set in as I realized how isolated and vulnerable I was to the dangers of the desert. That's when I heard it. A growling sound coming from around me. I couldn't pinpoint from where, it almost seemed like it was from everywhere. I could feel eyes watching me from the darkness and the sound of footsteps closing in. As the footsteps grew closer, I could see the shape of the skimwalker emerging from the shadows. It was the exact figure that had caused me to crash, but now it was even more grotesque and human looking. Its skin hung off its body in ragged strips, revealing patches of fur and scales underneath. Its eyes glowed with a sinister intelligence, and I knew I was in grave danger. I tried to free myself from the wreckage of my car, but it was no use. The skimwalker was almost upon me, and I knew this was the end. In a last-ditch effort, I managed to grab my camera and snap a photo of the creature before it reached me. That was the last thing I remember before everything went to black again. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed surrounded by concerned doctors and nurses. They told me that a group of hikers had found me and that I was lucky to be alive. But I knew the truth. I know what I encountered that day was a skimwalker, and it had run me off the road to claim me as its next victim. I still remember the creature, a continuous reminder of the horrors lurking in the Superstition Mountains, and I know I will never be the same again moving forward. Arizona Road Trip Disaster by Kai the Mechman. 
As I drove through the winding roads of the Superstition Mountains, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, like something was stalking me. The sun was setting, casting long shadows over the rocky terrain. I turned on my headlights, illuminating the road ahead, but the clouds seemed to grow darker. The mountains were known for their strange occurrences, but I had never believed in the supernatural. That was until something went very wrong. About halfway through the mountains, I saw a figure in the middle of the road. At first, I thought it was a deer or some other animal. But as I got closer, I realized it was a person. The figure was dressed in tattered clothing and shadows obscured their face. I slowed down, hoping the person would move out of the way. But for whatever reason, they just didn't. As I got closer, I could see they were staring at me with glowing eyes. The hairs on my neck instantly stood up and a chill ran down my spine. I tried to swerve to avoid them, but it was too late. I hit the person with a sickening thud, and my car came screeching to a halt. I was in shock, I'm not even going to lie. I couldn't believe what had just happened. I exited the car to check on the person, but I realized this was no human that I hit when I approached them. Their skin was cold and clammy. Their limbs were twisted at unnatural angles. It was then that I heard a faint murmuring coming from the darkness. Then, another whispering sound came from the other side of the darkness, and it became more frantic, and it's like it was growing louder. I could hear other strange noises from the shadows start to erupt. I turned to run back to my car, but it wouldn't start. Panic set in as I realized I was stranded in the middle of the mountains with something not from this world. I looked around and I could see movement in the shadows. It was as if something was crawling toward me, but I couldn't see what it was. The whispering grew louder, and I could feel it in my bones at this point. I was not alone in the darkness. I felt something brush against my leg, and I saw a hand reaching out from the darkness. It was cold and clammy, and it was definitely not human. I tried to shake it off, but it was too strong. Its grip was piercing. I was, I was being pulled into the shadows by an unseen force. I screamed and fought, but it was no use. I was being dragged deeper and deeper into the wilderness, the darkness. The whispering grew louder and more frantic as I pulled further and further away from the safety of my car. As the darkness consumed me, I realized the stories I heard about the Superstition Mountains were true. Something evil lived in these mountains, and I had become its latest victim. The whispering became a roar and I could feel something cold and slimy wrapping around my body. It was then that I saw a creature, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It had glowing red eyes, sharp claws and a mouth full of razor, sharp teeth. I was about to scream when luckily, a semi-truck came barreling past. The creature let me go, and I was able to literally, somehow, in the blink of an eye, run as fast as I could to the road to try to get help. The trucker luckily stopped, and I was saved, at least for the time being. Because every night since then I've had nightmares of this creature. I almost feel like it's coming for me. I almost feel like it's infected my inside, my brain. I don't know what to do. Maybe it's just PTSD. But thank you for allowing me to share my story. The Abandoned Cabin by Jonah G. I've always enjoyed hiking, but I never really expected to lose myself in the woods behind my local park. Now, at the time, it was getting kind of dark, and I started to panic. I tried retracing my steps, but everything looked the same. The trees towered above me, blocking out the moonlight, and the only sound was the rustling of leaves under my feet. Then, as I stumbled through the undergrowth, I saw something that made me stop in my tracks altogether. It was a small, dilapidated cabin. Its roof caved in and its walls were covered in moss. I approached, albeit cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest. As I stepped inside, I was hit by a wave of musty air. The cabin was dark and I could barely see my hand in front of my face. I fumbled in my backpack for a flashlight and turned it on, illuminating the dark room. It was empty, except for a few cobwebs and some old furniture covered in dust. But as I shone the light around the room, I noticed something on the floor. It was a small pile of bones. 
picked clean and bleached by the elements. My stomach turned, and I felt a bile rising in my throat. What had happened here? And did I find something that I shouldn't have seen? As I turned around to leave, something caught my eye outside the window. I stepped closer and peered out, my heart racing. It was a clearing, and in the center was a circle of stones covered in strange symbols. A small fire was in the process, and I could see shadows moving around it. I instantly felt my legs go weak and I stumbled backward, tripping over something on the floor. I looked down and saw it was a small journal, its pages yellowed and brittle. I picked it up and as I started to read the horror of what had happened here began to unfold. The journal belonged to a man who had lived in the cabin at some point or another. He had been a hermit, shunned by society and turned to dark magic to seek revenge on those who had wronged him. He had summoned a demon, which I guess had apparently possessed him, driving him to commit unspeakable acts of violence and depravity. As I read on, my hands were shaking. I realized that the shadows I had seen outside were not just shadows. They were the demonic creatures the hermit had summoned, and they were coming for me. I ran outside the cabin, my heart pounding, and stumbled through the woods. I could hear the creatures behind me, their growls and snarls echoing. I could hear the creatures behind me, their growls, their snarls echoing through the trees. I saw the park lights in the distance, and I ran toward them, praying for safety. I burst out of the woods, panting and covered in sweat, and collapsed. I looked back, but there was nothing there. Nothing was chasing me. The creatures were gone now, and the woods were silent once more. But the memory of what I had seen would haunt me for the rest of my life. I knew I had stumbled onto something awful in those woods and narrowly escaped with my life. Even ten plus years later, I'm a full-grown man now, and I still have no explanation for how I felt that pure feeling of dread that came over me. If anybody in the comments has any idea what I could have seen, what I could have experienced, please let me know. What is that smell? By NatureBot420 I've always enjoyed hiking and exploring the outdoors. But today's adventure in the woods is a nightmare that I'll never forget. Now, I had been wandering for hours in the woods like I typically do on the weekends. But I guess I had somehow lost all sense of direction after a while. Probably because I was so enthralled in the podcast I was listening to. Yet, every step takes me deeper into the forest. As I trudge on, my anxiety grows with each passing minute. The trees lower above me like dark sentinels their branches twisted and gnarled, reaching out to grab me. The silence is oppressive, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves or the snap of twig underfoot. Suddenly, a putrid smell assaults my nostrils. It's a sickly sweet odor mixed with something rotten and decaying. My mind begins to race as I try to pinpoint the source of the stench. I'm almost afraid to move, fearful of what I might find. But obviously, I can't stay still forever. I take a tentative step forward, the leaves crunching loudly beneath my feet. The smell grows more potent, more intense. My stomach churns and bile rises in my throat. I feel like I'm about to hurl, but then I see it. A, a dead animal lies just ahead. It's, it's bloated body swarming with flies. The sight and smell are overpowering, and I must cover my mouth and nose to keep from gagging. I turn away, but there's no escape. The scent lingers, clinging to my clothes, the air, and even my skin. I stumble forward, desperate to distance myself from the rotting corpse, but the smell seems to follow me, like a malignant presence. I can't shake it off. Finally, panic sets in and I run blindly through the forest. The trees blur past me, the ground uneven beneath my feet. I can hear my heart pounding in my ears. Something just feels wrong. I'm not even sure why I'm freaking out, it's just a dead animal after all. But there was just this overwhelming feeling that came over me the moment I saw that body. I just felt like, I shouldn't be seeing this. At this point, I am hopelessly lost with no idea how to find my way back. And still, the smell persists. It's everywhere, surrounding me, suffocating me, I feel like I'm drowning in it. As I run, I catch glimpses of other dead animals scattered throughout the woods. 
Now, that feeling I felt earlier is starting to make sense and clicking in my head all at once. Some of these animals are bloated and putrid like the first, while others are a little more than skeletons picked clean by scavengers. The smell grows stronger with each passing moment until all I can think about is that nauseating stench. I don't know how much longer I can keep going. My legs, they're, they're feeling like lead. My lungs are burning with exertion. But I know in my heart that I cannot stop. Not when this smell is so overpowering. It's like a beacon leading me deeper and deeper into the woods to my own demise. And that's when I hear it. This low growling noise coming from somewhere just ahead of me. It's a sound that will forever send shivers down my spine. It makes the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. I know, deep down, that it is not an animal. It's definitely not anything that I want to meet. But I can't turn back now. I'm trapped in this nightmare with no escape. So all I can do is keep running and hoping to find my way out of this nightmare. I keep on going. And I never actually see where this this creature is, this person, or whatever could possibly be looking out here in this graveyard, I guess. But I just kept running. Legs burning. Feet hurting. Lungs on fire. I honestly thought I was going to collapse and pass out at any moment. And just when I was about to give up and lay down and die, I break the bushes. And there I am, back into a clearing, a road just ahead of me, and there's civilization once more. I don't know how to explain what I went through. I don't even know what the heck was going on out there. I do plan on probably going back sometime soon to see if we can find these bodies, get some video evidence, and see if maybe anybody local has any idea as to what the heck is going on here. Our Ski Trip Turned Nightmare by Jerome Frogman I remember the excitement as I put on my ski gear and joined my friends for a day on the slopes. The weather was perfect, the fresh snowfall made the scenery even more beautiful, we hit the trails and spent the morning skiing and having a great time. But as the day wore on, we decided to venture off the beaten path and explore the more remote parts of the woods. We thought we knew the area pretty well, but we soon lost ourselves in the dense forest. The snow was falling heavily now. The visibility was rapidly decreasing. The panic didn't really begin to set in until we realized we were completely disoriented and honestly had no freaking idea where to go. We tried to retrace our steps, but the trees and the snow made it almost impossible to recognize any sort of landmark. Of course, as cliche, our freaking phones had no signal. The batteries were running low. We huddled together trying to stay warm, but the cold was honestly biting and relentless. As the night began to fall, strange noises started to fill the forest around me. It sounded like something was moving around us, circling us if you will. We could hear the sound of branches snapping and footsteps crunching the snow, but we could never actually see anything. We tried to reassure ourselves it was just wildlife, but the noises were getting louder and more menacing. Now I need to stop for a second and explain just how we were feeling mentally. Obviously physically, we were absolutely cold, we were shaking, and we were terrified. But mentally, I felt like we were pretty all there, you know? We weren't that far away from the ski resort. We were on the slopes just outside of them anyways, on, in, in the forest. I mean, we couldn't have gotten too far, right? There's no way we could have gotten that lost. I began to start to feel a strong sense of dread as we realized that we were not alone. We huddled together, scared and unsure of what to do. Then, suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream that echoed through the woods. We froze, too terrified to move. We knew that something was out there, something that meant harm to us. We decided to try to find our way out of those woods regardless of how dark it was. But again, the snow was deep and our strength waned. We stumbled through the dark, our legs aching and our hearts pounding. We were lost, alone, and at the mercy of the unknown. Adrenaline was the only thing keeping us moving at this point. As the night dragged on, we became more and more exhausted as it got colder and colder. Finally, when we were on the verge of collapse, we saw the lights of our rescue team in the distance. Relief flooded through us as we realized we were going to be rescued. We stumbled towards the lights, our legs weak and our bodies numb. Looking back on that night though, I've learned so much. I realized how close we came to tragedy. 
The forest can be dangerous, and it's important to respect its power. I'll never forget the terror of being lost in the woods, hunted by an unknown force, or at least maybe what I felt like was an unknown force, and it's a memory that still haunts me to this very day. Now, I know what a lot of people will think as they hear the end of the story. It was anticlimactic, and how did you even know anything was actually there? Maybe it was just another animal going by. And you know what? You're entirely right. But the adrenaline we got from the fear of the unknown that night is probably what saved us in the first place. Yosemite Nearly Ended Me by Anana Possum I'd always dreamed of hiking in Yosemite National Park. The vast wilderness, stunning landscapes, and the chance to escape the hustle and bustle of city life were what drew me to the great outdoors in the first place. But what I experienced was far beyond what I could have ever imagined. Walking through the forest, I realized I had lost the trail. The trees were so thick and tall that they blocked out the sun, and the dense undergrowth made it nearly impossible to see more than a few feet in front of me. I tried to retrace my steps, but every tree looked the same, and I found myself wandering through the woods. As the sun began to set, panic set in. I was lost and alone and had no idea how to return to civilization. I tried to use my phone, but of course there was no freaking signal. I had no food or water left, and my legs were aching from all the walking. When I thought things couldn't get any freaking worse, I tripped over a rock hard, hitting my head. When I came to, it was dark and the forest was eerily silent. I tried to stand up, but my legs gave out beneath me. I was injured, lost, and completely alone. Fear completely consumed me. I was gripped by anxiety, and I began to hear strange noises in the distance. Now, I can't tell you for the life of me if this was because of my head injury, and it likely was, but I felt like something was out there, watching me, waiting for me. As the night wore on, my injuries began to worsen. I could feel my body shutting down and my mind was playing tricks on me. Every rustle of leaves, snap of a twig, seemed like it was something coming to get me, some sort of sinister monster just waiting to eat me. And then I saw it. Again, I can't tell you if it was real or not. It was a dark figure lurking just beyond the trees. It was humanoid but distorted, with long, spindly limbs and glowing eyes. It, it seemed to be watching me, waiting for me to make a move. I tried to crawl away, but again my body was far too weak. My head was pounding. Dried blood had made it hard for me to fully open my eyelids. This figure began approaching me. I knew that this would probably be my end if it was not a hallucination. I closed my eyes and waited for my end to come, but when I opened my eyes again the figure was gone and the forest was bathed in an eerie light. The following day, I was found by a park ranger barely clinging to life. I had been missing for two days. My injuries were severe. I was rushed to the hospital where I spent several weeks recovering from my ordeal. This is something that is real life. Getting lost in the woods is very dangerous, my friends. So please, don't ever go off trail. Even if you see something cool that you want to photograph, even just for a second, especially if you're alone. I learned my lesson the hard way, and I still to this day have some long-lasting effects from that head injury. Sometimes I still see those images, and I know they're not real. At least I hope they're not. This happened to me when my pals and I went on a dropping trip. A dropping is when you are dropped at a place that you don't know and you have to find your way home while people in cars hunt for you, and when they spot you, you get a point. The person with the least points who gets to the designated place is the winner. My brother and six of my pals were fooling around acting stupid as we always did, causing my dad to say, Don't you numbskulls have anything better to do? Like what, dad? And my dad started thinking, Well, how about something outside? To which I just chuckled, but before I could say anything, Terry just said, What do you guys think about a dropping trip? We all agreed to this and made our home the place where we had to end up after being dropped. My parents dropped us all off, my mom said. Okay, let's see how long it takes you guys to travel 20 miles. 
They drove off, and we all went in different directions. Now, at this point, I understand 20 miles is a bit excessive. I've always been terrible with directions, so going through the woods probably wasn't the best idea either. I walked around for what seemed like hours until I heard a crying dog. Me being an animal lover, I went to look for what was wrong. I saw a wolf stuck in a bear trap, and I slowly walked toward the trapped wolf. It growled at me, but I slowly started getting closer to help it with the wolf starting to calm down and allowing me to set it free. The wolf looked at me and then just jumped up and walked off to which I did the same. After what felt like an hour, I accepted that I was lost and I just told myself that if I just keep walking in a straight line, I would eventually find my way to a road or something like that. I walked and walked for what felt like hours, but was still stuck in the woods when I heard branches breaking from behind me. My heart was pounding very hard, and I was getting more scared by the minute as the sun was starting to go down. In my mind, I was expecting a huge bear or something like that, but I heard a weird type of growl, more like a gurgling. I started running, which I know is not the smartest thing to do when facing a wild animal, but fear got the better of me in that moment. Not looking where I was running, I tripped and fell, hearing the footsteps gaining fast. It was then I heard barking and I went to look behind me and saw the wolf I had saved that was barking and standing in front of me. I then looked at the creature that was running after me. It was something that was extremely skinny with claws and was running away now. It ran in a weird way that I can't even describe. It was almost as it wasn't used to running and has never done it before. And then, this thing continued to do that gurgling growl. It was clearly coming from that creature. After the creature was out of sight, the wolf stopped barking, and when I stood up, it was standing right next to me. As I walked again, the wolf didn't leave my side and growled a few times more as I kept walking. Finally, I found a road with a diner, and after a few minutes, I realized it was the diner my dad usually goes to with his friends. So I was relieved to see a familiar sight. I turned my gaze to the wolf, and it was gone. I already began to hear that gurgling growl again, though. I'm pretty sure... That wolf protected me and saved my life because I helped it. I've heard many stories of wolves doing this with people and I'm just absolutely blown away that I was able to experience this. When I was at the door of the diner, I looked back to where the wolf and the creature were supposed to be fighting or whatever, but I didn't see anything. I arrived home last and clearly lost the dropping, but my mom looked at me and said, what happened to you? And I told them everything. My cuts from the fall, the, the, the wolf, everything. Occasionally, I still talk about this story. I don't think many people believe it, but it's something that I'll forever cherish. But it really freaked the hell out of me. Does anybody have any idea what that creature could have been? From research, it kind of sounds like a skinwalker or a wendigo or something along those lines, but I know that's incredibly cliche. I moved from Idaho to Alaska about two months ago and already I have experienced something I never thought I would ever experience. After taking a week to recover from a five-day trek across Canada on the Alaska Highway, I decided I was going to get out and explore the wilderness of my new home state and try to catch a glimpse of the wildlife such as moose and bears. The house I'm renting is on the outskirts of the nearest town so I basically live right in the middle of the forest and have access to miles of dense woods. I still don't know what I'd been thinking when I decided to go into the woods without anything but my phone, which at the time didn't get much service in Alaska, and some earbuds. I began running at a medium pace into the woods, hopping over bushes and branches while jamming out to some shaky graves. I had probably gone through about five songs when my shoelace got hooked on a fallen tree and I was thrown to the ground face first. I immediately got back up, swore out of irritation, and began to put my earbuds back in when I realized I had no idea where I was. At some point I had lost my sense of direction and had only but a faint idea as to which direction I had came from. I started to run the way I thought I had came from when I began to panic and second guess myself, when I realized I should have come out into my backyard ages ago. I didn't want to panic because I knew that it would make everything worse. Panicking never helps. I started to try and pinpoint the right direction. Of course, I eventually realized that I was hopelessly and utterly lost without the slightest indication of which way would bring me to some sort of civilization. After a few brief moments of cursing and groaning, 
I decided I would follow my gut and go in the direction I thought would possibly lead me home. I started running at full speed, hoping to break the tree line in a matter of minutes when something on the ground caught my eye. It was a backpack. I stopped instantly and looked around for a person or a campsite, but there was nothing I could see from the spot I was at, which was situated at the bottom of a small hill. The bag looked as if it had been abandoned for quite a few days at least, but was slightly damp from the rain earlier that morning. I kneeled and picked the bag up, resting it against my knees. It had a heavy weight to it when I moved it, so I knew there was something inside. Looking back now, I remember the dark feeling I got in my chest right before I unzipped the main part of the backpack. Inside, there were bags of what I immediately knew were some sort of assortment of illegal drugs and items used to administer them. I quickly stood up and took a step back. I had such a powerful feeling of dread that I felt like I was in imminent danger. I just wanted to get out of there and find my way home, so I started running again to the top of the hill. I was hit with a wave of excitement when I saw a house at the bottom that was buried in the trees. I had begun to start to make my way for it when something told me to stop inside my head. It crept into my mind that what I had just discovered was awfully close to this house. I wanted so badly to be out of the woods and find some form of civilization, but something told me that I just wasn't safe out here. I ran away from the house along the tree line hoping that I would possibly stumble upon another house. After about 10 to 15 minutes, I stumbled into a neighborhood of sorts and asked a man working in his yard for directions. He was kind enough to drive me home and assure me everybody gets lost in Alaska at some point. As soon as I got home, I showered and chugged some water, then immediately called the police to report what I had seen. However, since I had no idea where I was, I couldn't tell them where to find the drugs or where the house was, so my report was basically useless. I, I just felt so guilty if I hadn't at least said something. I've driven all over the area down different roads trying to find that house, but I never have. It's probably for the best though because I don't want to get caught up in something I shouldn't be in. I'm glad I listened to my gut that day and kept running from that house because people in possession of such many illegal drugs can be extremely dangerous. And I'm just glad I didn't die out there when I got lost. My cousin still loves me telling her this story at 21 with a two-year-old kid. She always told me to share this with more people, so I guess this is the best way to have more people actually hear this story. It might be a fun campfire story to tell others yourself. Anyway, here it is. There is a legend about these woods that are called the Burberry Witch, a witch that can control some terrifying creatures but will only do so when provoked or angered and will grant you something you want but for a price. My stepfather was a terrible man, hitting my mother, scolding her, and even threatening to seriously hurt myself. It was one of those days when my stepdad began to threaten to beat me, so I went to my room, locked it, and threw my head into the pillow of the bed, avoiding hearing any of the screaming. The day after, my mom knocked on my door and said that he had apologized like he had done all those times before, but my mom, she looked different. Almost a dead sort of look in her eyes. She then said that we would go to the cabin at the lake that used to belong to my grandparents, which they left to us after they died, and I just started packing. I wasn't very excited about it at all. We arrived at the cabin and I unpacked in my room. Of course, my stepfather wanted something and we were too slow to get it to him, so the scolding began. He would sit in a chair and just gulp the beer down like lemonade. He ordered my mom to get him stuff the whole time and was degrading her. I was so angry again but I knew that I wasn't strong enough to take down anybody. Then, it was time for dinner, and we sat down at the kitchen table. It was still fairly sunny at that time, and it was then that he threw a plate of food at my mom and tried to pull my hair, but I got away. It was then that I could no longer take it. I headbutted him, which made him fall, and he yelled something obscene at me. I then burst out of the door running into the woods, not looking back for a second, crying and just going God knows where. After a while, I fell onto my knees, just crying until I heard a noise. I looked up and there was a mountain lion. Out of fear, I fell backward on my hands with the mountain lion hissing at me, and I knew I would die right then and there. Then, out of nowhere, the mountain lion was grabbed by a massive claw with razor-sharp nails, followed by what sounded like a bear shouting and terrified. I closed my eyes. The mountain lion was making a huge ruckus that suddenly stopped and immediately I felt fluids flow over me. 
It felt like a bucket of water being emptied over yourself. After two thuds, I slowly opened my eyes and there it stood. A creature that looked like a black bear but bigger, with glowing blue eyes. And I noticed the claws that grabbed the mountain lion belonged to it. It growled, and I was so scared it would attack me when I heard clapping. The creature then just went on all fours and ran back into the woods. I checked myself and saw I was covered in blood. It had to be the blood of the mountain lion, but before I could get up, I heard a voice saying, Oh my sweetie, are you alright? A woman was now standing over me extending her hand and smiling. I accepted her hand and she pulled me up to say afterward, Sweetie, you seem to be covered in blood from that nasty mountain lion. The woman checked me and I checked her. Her hair was black with white parts in it and her eyes were a gorgeous baby blue. Well, why don't we go to my house so you can freshen up, okay sweetie? She said with a huge smile and since I felt no ill intent coming from the woman, I went with her. We arrived at a huge wooden house and after the woman showed me where to freshen myself up, clearing the blood from my clothes and body, I sighed. Oh, my goodness, what a huge sigh for such a young sweet thing like you. And I sat in the chair that the woman had prepared for me and told her everything. She stroked my cheek and said, Well, after a few hours, we shall go to your mom and I'm sure that awful man will get what's coming to him. But for now, just close your eyes and sleep, sweetie. As she stroked my head, I fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up and I was startled to see that I saw the head of a wolf. After I looked again, I noticed it was a carpet with a wolf head. And man, did I feel stupid. Oh, so you are awake, sweetie. Now, here, have some breakfast, the woman said and put a plate on the table near me. I got up and saw it was my favorite, pancakes. I ate as many as I could and I heard the woman giggle. It tasted well, it seemed, she said with a huge smile, which she followed with, well, it's time to get you back now, sweetie. I really didn't want to go back to that man and got a little mad at the thought of seeing him, but the woman grabbed my hand and smiled. We started walking and I couldn't believe how far I had to run the night before as we walked. We heard a sort of chirping growl. I can't explain it any other way than that because it sounded like a bird if it would growl. The woman turned her head away from me and I could see she was looking angry at the direction the sound was coming from and waved her hand. The next thing I heard were some wings flapping, but couldn't see a bird or anything except the branches of the trees moving as we walked further. We arrived at the cabin and I knocked. My mom opened the door and just threw her arms around me. She hugged me tightly before we heard him saying, <laughs> The twerps back and brought an old hag as well. The woman just said, My sir, that is not a kind thing to say, but if I could please use your bathroom. And my mom looked at my stepdad. Fine, just don't take too long. I walked the woman to the bathroom. She put a bag of coffee on the table nearby. My mind was trying to figure out when she had grabbed a bag since I was sure she didn't take one with her when we left. I walked a little with her to the bathroom, but I heard my stepdad yelling at my mom, I'm going to go fish in a bit, and that hag better be gone. As soon as he stopped yelling, I noticed the woman was gone and I, opened, and I opened the bathroom where she was now not there. Now I started looking all over for her, and when I looked out the kitchen window, I saw her standing at the boat. How did she get there that fast without even going through any of the doors? The doors do creak after all. The woman clearly saw me and put her finger against her lip, winking at me. The kitchen door then slammed shut and it was my stepdad who just put his hand on my mouth, gripping it tightly while saying, Don't think I forgot about you, little troublemaker, because after I'm done fishing, you're mine. He let me go and I heard the toilet flush and saw the woman coming out of the bathroom. In my mind, I was telling myself, How, how, how is this happening? She looked sternly at my stepdad, then walked out to the cool box, which was without a doubt filled with alcohol, and walked to the boat. He got on the boat when my mom walked into the kitchen and hugged me again. I'm so happy you're okay, darling, she said with a sob in her voice, and the woman then put her hand on my mom's shoulder and said, Don't worry, dear, that awful man will be receiving payback for everything he has done to the both of you very, very soon. And the woman quickly followed it up by asking if we wanted some tea, and of course we said yes. My mom and I just saw my stepdad struggling to reel something in. I then saw a huge spiked fin breaking the water. Then quickly, it went down in the water again. Oh, sweetie, did you see something in the water? The woman just blurted out out of nowhere, sipping on tea. How could she possibly be sipping tea already? There was no way that the water would be warm enough for tea. But the woman just asked, Are you going to have your tea, dears? There were cups of warm tea standing in front of us. 
Then we heard the water stirring and saw the fit again. Then out of nowhere, a creature came out of the water jumping on the boat. It was covered in scales that were green and blue and its head looked like a piranha with webbed fingers and pointy nails. Suddenly it slashed at my stepdad and hit his arm. My stepdad fell and the creature went right after my stepdad. Oh, what day is it today, dear? Was all the woman said as the creature was attacking my stepdad, to which my mom could barely make out. I it's Wednesday. The woman signed, which she followed. No, 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 no. What a terrible thing of me to do. How could I forget to feed it yesterday? After which she took a sip of her tea. Then we saw an arm flying out of the boat and blood was still flying everywhere. The lower half of the foot followed after as we watched in horror to what was happening in the boat. The creature went down even more, and when it was rising, it had the head of my stepdad in its mouth, lifting the body of my stepdad as well. We could see his blood-soaked clothing and the blood dripping from his neck. Then the creature slammed his jaws together, making the body of my stepdad drop, the blood dripping from the creature's mouth. With the body of my stepdad lying half out of the boat and half in the creature's mouth, it jumped back into the water. I and my mom shocked by what we had witnessed. The woman just said, Well, sweetie, I told you that awful man was going to get what was coming to him. And she put her cup down. Oh my, you haven't touched your tea yet, she calmly said as she was walking out of the kitchen door and stopped. She turned her head around to us and said with a smile, This one shall require no pay as I despise such men, and you are always welcome to my woods, but please do not bring another like him or there will be a payment. She walked to the edge of the wooded area and where the bear creature stood, and she stroked its chin while presenting a devilish smile on her face.